Start. OTB AM with Gillette, proud supporters of Movember. Gentlemen, let's move. It's me. Ah, and we're live. My microphone on? Yes, it is. There you go. Uh, Owen, good morning to you. How are you? <laughs> uh, I'm good. How are you keeping? How long was I there for? Uh, it was, all we got was it's me or something at, at the end of it. So uh, I don't know who you were talking to, but uh, literally can, uh, nobody. Literally nobody. <laughs> How are you, Owen? Celebrating? Uh, celebrating, yeah. I mean, what a what a week! What a week to be a, a human being. Th thank thank God for everybody in Pfizer because Kerry versus Cork is now in the rear view mirror. We uh, can no longer talk about what happened in Cork on Sunday. So uh, apologies for that, everybody, because this is a, a vaccine only place. Yeah, there'll be no thanking God for science's breakthroughs here. Well, you can you can stick a, your Trumpisms up your go turn on. Turn a phrase, a turn a phrase, a reflex. Uh, I mean, it does do one thing, I, I, and I don't want us to gloss over the pain that Kerry feel this morning, and so therefore I'm going to tell everybody now that the big event of today is, of course, the power rankings. They're coming up for us a little bit later on. I don't want anybody to be in any way sidetracked from the fact that Kerry got knocked out of the championship with the last kick of the game from somebody who hasn't kicked a football in senior championship. Was that his first kick in senior championship ever, essentially? Is that Marquis' first senior kick? It was. It must have been. I don't remember any other kicks in the game. Look, sure, there you go. Um, besides that, yesterday the news broke that we have a, a vaccine. <laughs> and, uh, and look, you know, it, the timing is curious. I salute the timing. Those people who decided that, I'm not sure if we have enough information just yet. Let, I think we need to sit on this for a day or two. Oh, it, we now have enough information. Oh, look, the election's over. That was amazing, a masterpiece of timing. Mm. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I do love a good conspiracy theory. And uh, there you go. So, uh, what does this mean for next year? The Euros, pan-European Euros, not, not now suddenly going to be in Russia, which was one of the things that they were talking about. The Lions Tour, which was definitely up in the, up, uh, up in the air, whether or not they were going to go if there was no crowds. The Olympics, the Paralympics, the Ryder Cup, which was postponed from this year. What have I, have I missed anything? That's enough. For just, that's just the summertime. We'll have 80,000 in Croke Park. I suspect that they could put on Longford versus Leitrim in Croke Park and open it up and you'd get 80,000 at it because everyone would be like, we're allowed to go to games again. Let's go and see what happens. <laughs> uh, like that, that, would be, that would be quite the moment. Like I, so so you're, going, you're going all in on this then? Oh, there's, yeah. There's no, there's no part of you that's like, uh, on two fronts, one that let, let's wait and see a little bit more until you know we have a, a greater sample size. I know these people are actual scientists and they know what they're doing when they're coming out and actually making any public pronouncement. And then second of all, uh, it, the other part of this is just well, uh, enough people get vaccinated for the, the you know a pan-European competition in the summer of 2020. Like if it's going to be 1.2 billion people who get vaccinated next year, is that going to be enough for a pan-European Euros? Maybe not because it's about people filtering in and out of cities and society as much as people who are actually going into stadiums. Why are you, you know, raining so. my parade? Give me 24 hours and no rain in my parade, please. I mean, because look, I'm, I'm, I'm just dreaming here. This week. I'm just dreaming here, Owen. And you, with your feet of clay, reminding us all that life, having no alternative, Sean, and nothing new, whatever. No, no, we're, we're, we're going to the Euros. You know, we're going to go to all those cities that we would have gone to if only Ireland had qualified. I mean, it's going to rub it in, even make it more pronounced that like all of Europe will be coming to Dublin to hang out in Temple Bar and sing Sweet Caroline and we'll all be joining in going, oh, look, isn't that a lovely scene? Look at them licking, licking each other's faces and, and fair play to them for us. I would love to see that right now. I'm, I'm not going <laughs> to lie. At the same time, maybe like a lot of caution right now comes from not only a place of being cautious, but from a place of being a little bit enamoured with everybody's current situation right now. Maybe we won't let lockdown go too easily. Maybe, maybe part of us are feeling a little bit of Stockholm syndrome with our captor, which is coronavirus. Maybe this, this is how we're all feeling. Maybe there's just a little bit of a hesitation, just like there was at the start of this thing going into 
a phase where we won't be able to see people maybe actually coming out of our shells could be a harder process maybe going back to a game maybe we actually like binging sport on television all weekend maybe none of us actually had a desire to go somewhere like i don't know parky queeve on sunday maybe i was totally happy just being in the confines of my own home i like do, 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 have you binged everything you said you, you you wanted to binge i wonder have you read the books that you said you were going to read have you read the, have you learned that second language the clock is ticking and with that comes a sense of anxiety and are you ready for a non-covid world is all i'm asking Probably not. Now, what you're saying is that already the Reddit accounts are opening up and um, uh, the BuzzFeed stories are the top five things, top 21 things, top 50 things about uh, lockdown that we'll miss. Uh, I mean, I would say that there's like a short window for us to publish this content and, uh, and massively explode. So maybe, maybe instead of doing the show today, we'll just get people to send us in their favourite things for, for lockdown and we'll rip it off and we'll put it into an article and we'll be rich off the back of it. And, yeah. you know, us and those Tory cronies will be the ones who've uh, benefited most from uh, lockdown and from uh, the whole coronavirus shenanigans. We, we are one of the same, really, Tory cronies. Like, I mean, it's, I, I don't know, I, I, do you not feel any kind of pang of nostalgia for... You know, April, when there was no sport and there was clear decks, when the nights were getting a little bit longer, when, I don't know, there were, the, the world was your oyster, basically. You weren't uh, a slave to watch. I'm sure you've watched Cork versus Kerry about 10 times since Sunday. A slave to a big game like that or, or something. Like are, are you, like, are you ready to actually go back out there and take your fancy tickets and go to a Six Nations game, for example, ne next year? This is a, a life-changing moment if, if this is going to be the case for us. Um, I'm definitely ready to go and see some sport again. Yeah, absolutely. I will miss the fact that there's no traffic on the roads and that the only person you speak to is the guard going, where are you going? I'm going to work. Okay, off you go. Like, uh, and yeah, I, I, the roads were safe to cycle on. That was like, a, I mean, if only we could make the roads safe for cyclists, then that would be great. And if only we could reduce the traffic, if only we could have more people uh, living outside of the big metropolitan areas and, and working remotely, wouldn't that be a great thing? Like well, th th this is a thing that definitely came into my head yesterday evening when, when I was thinking about this vaccine is that we're all kind of going to go back to normal, aren't we? Like th this, it was very easy to say in the depths of, you know, either the first or the second lockdown that the world has changed forever. And when I say the world, I mean, you know, Irish society, for example, like, do you really expect there to be a massive downturn in how everybody operates, say, in the year 2022? It's not going to be a case that actually after a few months of uh, the, the company that operates beside you being back in their office, does, does that not mean that that company then kind of gets uh, a little bit of neighbourly jealousy and moves all their troops back into their office or, or whatever it may be? That's just a, a work setup. I, I just think that there is still enough of... Uh, the normality is recent enough for us to have a natural reflex to want to go back to it. And I think uh, maybe come 2022... We, we could be in a place where it's like, hold on a minute, this uh, vaccine didn't actually change that much. Maybe there's there, maybe there'll be a few extra cycle lanes, and that'll be a, a positive. But this actual whirlwind change, using your example of Dublin being a safe city to cycle in, is that actually going to be the eventual consequence of this, or is it actually going to be, hold on a minute, this feels awfully like 2019 all over again I think, when things do, do get back up and running? I, I feel like there's been a, a mass movement where people have decided that they don't want to live the same lives that they were living before this. And mm. it's going to be interesting to see who, who characterizes or who capitalizes on that and whether any political forces seize that moment and go, okay, we are the representatives of that bunch of people who had had enough, were slightly mad about it who didn't like the housing crisis, who didn't like the traffic, who didn't like the lack of childcare, who didn't like the lack of opportunities, the gig economy, the fact that yesterday women stopped being paid for the rest of the day, if you look at the, or the rest of the year in terms of um, gender imbalance and pay. I think there's probably somebody out there who's smart enough to pull all those together and go, well, we're going to be the people who represent you politically, and these are the changes that we're going to offer. And I think there's going to be a lot of um, a surge in activism and a surge in popularity around that. Because, like... Was was the country a great country uh, before this all happened? I'm not sure. I mean, no. There was loads of things that were wrong with it that we think now it turns out was actually pretty easy to fix. You just do yeah. it and go. Right, this is what we're going to do. How does everybody feel? Okay, great, let's go. And that's all it takes. It's like the GA <laughs> Championship. Honestly, <laughs> the GA Championship is the greatest example ever of. Oof, we can never do this, and in two years' time, we might have the perfect GA Championship. Like. One of the options on the table is the absolute dream scenario of 
your first competition is your uh, local provincial competition and then the championship is a, a league-based format over the summer. And it's like, wow, that would be amazing. But all it took was a global pandemic. And it almost feels uh, fanciful when you say that it would be amazing for this thing to become the reality. Like, it's, it's kind of sad, actually, that you would be thinking to yourself, look at this amazing GA championship proposal. We're obviously never going to get this thing because it's good. And that has been the way I certainly thought about operations and uh, the, the, like the, the possibility of new structures in, uh, in, in, the, in Gaelic games. And because it has been good and because suggestions have been good, you naturally feel that, well, this will never happen because there's enough vested interest. And I just wonder if there's still, are those vested interests still going to pop up and still uh, provide barriers to, to change in the GEA? And I think, I, like, it, it is a good point, actually, of being a, a little bit of the country in microcosm. Like, I think those barriers to change that existed in the country before COVID would probably pop right back up. And, like, whether it's, uh, like, if you, if you look from housing right down to, to traffic to, to commuting, like, I definitely think there's enough factors for us to be really cautious about us getting back into society and all the good things from COVID to actually come to the fore. I think that if you go back into society, there's probably, I personally would brace myself for all the, the negativity that comes with it. But look, I'm in a terrible mood all week, so uh, maybe <laughs> it's me just raining on your parade. And did the vaccine not give you some, are you like, no, I don't believe it, until, it's, until someone no, no, is jabbing me twice, good. until I feel the surge of whatever the, the new modern uh, fancy technology they're using, which isn't actually a little mini dose of COVID, which I was like, wow, that's, that, I mean, the science behind this is yeah. unbelievable. Um, mRNA. Until they're literally jabbing you in the armour that you'll be like, I don't believe it. No, I'm not one of those people. Uh, I'm, like, I, I am actually glass half full when it comes to these sort of things. But uh, just to reiterate, it's been, a, it's been a terrible, terrible week. So uh, ev everything is awful, uh, despite my glass half fullness uh, half the time. It's an amazing weekend of GAA activity to look forward to as well. There was the qualifier draw yesterday, which sees uh, Davy versus Lowen. Um, there is also the small matter of the Munster and Leinster hurling finals, and uh, we'll talk about those. There are Leinster semi finals in football, and there are plenty of stories to get our teeth stuck into as well. If you want to get involved, we'd love to hear from you. 087 180 180 is the number. And a reminder OTBM is live in association with Gillette. Good morning, start with Gillette, giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. Oh, and I kind of ha half expected you to have handlebars on your moustache or like a, a goatee, but you, you just... Um... No, doesn't work, unfortunately. I, I, did, I did consider it. Well, I didn't even give the goatee an opportunity to thrive. I just had made my decision before uh, going for the shave yesterday. And it turns out actually moustache look you can't like go like this to see what the moustache looks like turns out. It actually looks totally different when you've got uh, pieces of bare skin all around it. So maybe I should have given the goatee a chance, but no, I, I figured beforehand it wouldn't really work. Well there's a there's a whole month to go. This is the month of November and uh, we're doing it. We're gonna hear from a couple of others or see from a couple of others a little bit later on uh, in that as well. So anyway, it is what, seven forty three this morning. Phil Egan is with us. Phil, good morning to you. Good morning, Joe. How are you doing? What are you most looking forward to going and seeing and being present for? In terms of... When you get jabbed with the vaccine. I don't know, maybe you're anti-vax, I don't know. No, no, I'm not... I should have asked you. No, no, I'm not anti-vax, but I, I'm not mad about needles. Even looking at the pictures of people getting jabbed in the arm freaks me out a little bit. Maybe it's thinking back to when I was a kid and they used to trick you when they say, if you just look over there now and then bang, jab you in the arm and they give you a lollipop <laughs> and then you go away thinking... That was uh, horrific. So I don't know if I'm over it, but you just gotta you gotta do it. You gotta take it and uh, yeah, take the shot in the arm. But going to matches, um, maybe going to going to concerts, that kind of thing. Even just just that normality. Do you know, actually, I was in the supermarket the other day. I missed the samples. Do you know when you yeah. used to go around, yeah. you get the samples. Sometimes you be you be hungry. You think it's nearly dinner, but I'm not going to be home for another hour. The samples will fill me for the next hour, and I'll get home. <laughs> But they're gone now. And I mean, I, like Guns in and Cornell's Court would be my oh, local posh. shop, right? So Very posh. they put on some spread. I'd say they do. Ah, like, I mean, you, you can. Beef when, carpaccio, some yeah. truffle, there's all always that kind a good, of stuff. There's always a nice fish dish there for you. There's oh, yeah. definitely something sweet as well. So you just go around and you know what? You can you can do the loop as well where you you might actually go, get it. You can go twice and she'd get like, seconds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that was something that crossed my mind when I was there the other day because I was starving. I thought, so. Where are we starting? We're going to start with the League of Ireland. Obviously, it was the final night of Premier Division action and Finn Harps, they pulled off the great escape. They hit the right note to leave Shells shocked on the final night. Harps won three of their last four games to avoid relegation. First half goal from Adam Foley gave them a 1-0 win at home to Waterford. So Shells were beaten 2-0 by Shamrock Rovers. 
at Talca Park. I Meaning Rovers actually went unbeaten in the league this season. Shells will now play Longford Town in the promotion relegation playoff. That loss for Waterford meant that Dundalk secured the final European spot despite a 2 0 defeat at home to Sligo Rovers. Now, the door is not closed for European football in terms of Sligo because Sligo finished fourth. That might be enough if one of the teams above them, one of the three teams above them, so Dundalk, Bohemians and Shamrock Rovers go on to win the FAI Cup and there's a strong possibility that would happen, which means Liam Buckley's side would claim a Europa League qualifier spot. Bohemians themselves won 2-1 away to St Pat's and have finished one all between Cork City and Derry City at Turner's Cross. The Republic of Ireland squad will continue preparations today for Thursday night's friendly against England at Wembley. Stephen Kenny's squad are due to train in Barnet today. Plenty of stuff from Aaron Connolly in the back pages from where he sat on the plane on that trip to Slovakia um, to the lack of goals in the Ireland team at the moment. Widely reported England may have to play next week's Nations League game against Iceland at a neutral venue in Albania. Germany is another venue that could be possible. It's because of UK travel bans in place for arrivals from Denmark who play Iceland in Copenhagen on Sunday. Now, England play Belgium on Sunday. If England were to lose that game, the game against Iceland could actually be redundant. So that might actually help things. Sheffield Wednesday are looking for a new manager after sacking Gary Monk. They are second from bottom in the championship with just one win in the last six games. They would actually be outside the relegation zone in 21st place had it not been for a six-point deduction for breaking financial rules. James Lowe is expected to be handed his first Ireland cap today. Head coach Andy Farrell will name his team for Friday's Autumn Nations Cup game against Wales at the Aviva Stadium. John Cooney was among the try scorers for Ulster last night as they beat Glasgow by 40 points of 15 at Kingspan Stadium. They secured the bonus point in the process. First time in four years Ulster have won their first five Pro 14 games. And obviously it's Masters week. We know Sergio Garcia has tested positive for coronavirus, so the 2017 winner won't be at Augusta. Paul McGinley, uh, obviously he's going to be on Sky's coverage, was asked about Rory McIlroy and he said he'd be surprised if McIlroy challenges this week. Uh, if you think McIlroy obviously has won four majors, never won the Masters, has five top tens in his last six Masters starts, but plenty of coverage in the papers from McGinley basically saying that if it was April, McIlroy was in prime position to win the Masters, but not right now. Never since he's had that kid. That's what, that's what happens when you become a dad. Right, Phil, good stuff. Thanks a million for that. We'll talk a bit more about Roy McIlroy's struggles a little bit later on with John Duggan too. 7.47 this morning. I'm delighted to say Daniel Harris is with us. Daniel, good morning to you. How are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you? Um, today's the first day that I've noticed. It's, it's weird. Normally it happens last week. As soon as Halloween is over, the transfer gossip for the uh, January uh, transfer window begins just around the same time as the first Christmas uh, lights go up in the shops. And um, Paul Pogba seems to be the available... Uh, player at the moment and uh, these international breaks are always an opportunity for us to just um, take stock and listen to the gossip coming from the French cap and French camp and it seems uh, more pronounced the talk from the French camp than it has been before maybe I'm reading too much into it but um, for the first time it feels like there's a real possibility that this might happen mid-season as opposed to at the end of the year uh, I guess it depends if anyone's got the money for him if someone did have the money for him, I'm sure United would sell him because I'm sure they would have sold him this summer and I'm sure they would have sold him last summer as well. Um, I think that United have now been waiting four years to see what they thought they were buying and Pogba has been waiting four years to play in a team that will allow him to do what it is that he wants to do. And the match has never quite worked and it doesn't look like it's going to work. And it's now the case that when United have a game that they've really got to win, Paul Pogba doesn't play. Yeah, which was evident at the weekend. When the, when the team came through, you were like, right, this is Solskjaer's best team because he's fighting for his job. Yeah, yeah. I mean, no, I don't think anyone thought that Pogba was going to play at the weekend. He, and I think what's going to happen sooner or later is he'll stop being the first change as well because at the moment he's generally coming on before Donny van der Beek. And uh, I'm not sure that will carry on for too much longer either, particularly if it looks, it starts to look like he's definitely going to leave. I mean, I saw Juventus were talking about maybe signing him my guess is that he'll still end up going to Paris and because um, that would suit him better. He's the kind of player that Paris could do with. They don't have a lot of class in midfield. And it's probably the kind of thing that would suit him quite nicely, being the kind of luxury player in the best team in a not particularly high standard league. This might not be disconnected from the news that there's um, vaccine imminent from Pfizer yesterday, where suddenly 
um, banks will lend to other companies on the basis that there will be fans in football stadiums sooner rather than later. That's the, how this, the economics of this, of, of a deal the size of Pogba might end up working. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, if clubs think they're going to have money, then they'll feel more inclined to spend it. And that doesn't just apply to clubs that are borrowing money from the bank. It applies to clubs with, with owners, with people that will put the money in if they think they're going to get the money out in Champions League appearances or Champions League progress and all the rest of it. And so, yeah, I think that if United knew that they were selling Pogba and they knew that there were going to be fans in the ground, then they'd be more inclined to try and set up some deals for the winter as well. If anybody missed the Didier Deschamps quote, he said that Pogba's in a situation with his club where he can't be happy, neither with his playing time nor with his positioning. He's not in his best period. He's had a series of injuries and COVID-19, which has hit him quite hard. He needs to find his rhythm. He then goes on to say that there's no concern when a player is in discomfort in his club. He is happy to play for France. He will tell me about his feelings. And as I know him very well, it will go in a positive direction. That bit about his positioning, Daniel, suggests that Ole Gunnar Solskjaer is somewhat to blame for Pogba's dip in form. A good bit to blame, actually, according to Deschamps. Well, I think the first thing to note is, is the absence of uh, Paul Pogba's dismay at all, everything but his performances. Uh, that Deschamps, I mean, I know Deschamps can't really say that he's not happy with how he's playing, but why can't he say that? Because he's not playing well. And the reason he's not in the team isn't because he's playing really well and the manager has a grudge against him. The manager's given him every opportunity to succeed, and I think he's given him more opportunities to succeed than he's earned. And he's not played well enough to, maintain, to retain the place in the team. And that isn't because the manager doesn't want to pick him. Not picking him is a massive ball ache for the manager. And nonetheless, he still carried on picking him when what he saw on the pitch didn't really justify that. So in terms of the positioning, I think that Pogba has dis disappointed in every possible position that he could possibly have played in for United. He's also had some decent games, but he's played as a number 10. He's played on the left of a diamond. He's played on the left of a three. He's played uh, in a double pivot. He's played on the right of a three. Uh, where else is there that he could possibly play? I think the problem for Paul Pogba since Bruno Fernandes arrived is that the job of hanging about waiting to do something nice has gone to someone who does it way, way better. Bruno Fernandes' numbers are miles better than Pogba's ever were, and he'll also put in a shift. And those are things that Pogba doesn't, doesn't quite do. Pogba, Pogba's a, a beautiful football player, but sometimes he forgets that he's not he's not playing not just playing he's competing and that i think is really the main difference between him and bruno fernandez and you can't, it's very hard to structure a midfield with pogba and bruno fernandez in it it's not impossible united did it after lockdown but i think looking back now the main reason that did work after lockdown was that teams weren't that fit so united looked fitter than other teams in that first period but also they weren't getting run off the pitch. They weren't. They weren't getting run off the pitch by teams with who who were running harder than they were. And then that started to happen against uh, Southampton and uh, Southampton and West Ham, teams that pressed United on the ball and ran hard. And suddenly that Matic, Pogba, Fernandez midfield didn't work that well anymore. United United forced it through and they hung in there to get as, enough points that they needed to finish third. But to complain about Paul Pogba playing out of position when he's played in literally every position and disappointed in all of them is is ludicrous. And I don't know, like Deschamps might just be saying it because obviously he wants to stay on the right side of Paul Pogba because he needs Paul Pogba. Or he might think that it's genuinely the case, in which case uh, I really do not know. Well, this is what Manchester United want to be out in the ether, isn't it? That they want people to be thinking that Paul Pogba has been screwed over in some way by Manchester United because if people think that, then they'll probably pay a higher transfer fee next summer. Uh, I'm not sure. Like, generally, you get your lower transfer fees when there's a player who everyone knows you don't really want to use and you don't really want about. So I think that it's probably at the case now with Pogba where United would take something to be able to reinvest in the team, to get him and his wages away so that they can buy someone else. And uh, it's a deal would suit both parties. I'm absolutely sure that Pogba would like to go somewhere. And I'm absolutely sure that United would like to sell him somewhere. And it won't be the 120 million quid or whatever that United would like to get. It will probably be somewhere more like 60 to 80 million quid. And I think if that happened, both sides would accept that it hadn't quite worked and wish each other good luck and get on with their lives. Who would be buying the players that Manchester United would use 
the money that they raised from Pogba. Who's responsible for that? Do we know? Uh, I'm pretty sure that Ole Gunnar Solskjaer has signed off on the players. Uh, I'm sure that it's not just go and get me X and that's it because most clubs don't work like that. And it, there's no reason for it to work like that. If you want it, if you if you're making a, a decision worth tens of tens of millions of pounds and over years is going to cost you more than that, then it's reasonable that you would have to make your case to someone else and there will be other people involved in making the decision because you would want people doing the, you would need people doing the research and you want people to bounce ideas off. So I don't think that I think I mean I think I would say that in terms of who United need, who is the player that United need? I'm sure Oligan Solskjaer has sign off, but in terms of spending the money, uh, I'm sure Ed Woodward has sign off and the Glazers have sign off because ultimately they're in charge. And much as anyone sensible would love that to not be the case, it's a fact. So I imagine that the transfer department, like Matt Judge and the analytics team and uh, the scouts, are involved in identifying players. And what will probably happen is Ole will say, I need players for this position. Uh, and the analytics team and the scouts at the same time will be coming to him saying, we really like this player. And they'll have a look at the data. They'll watch them play. And then they will go to the money men and they'll say, we need a player for this position. And this is our one, two, three. Do me a deal. And Edward Wood will generally come back and say, I haven't done you a deal for your first touch, but I've done you a deal for your first, uh, for your first target but I've done your deal for this one, and, and Ole will either say yes or no. So it functions the way everybody else's uh, transfer departments function, essentially. Uh, the, the one thing that we've kind of learned over the last while is that there is a, a few people very clever at Liverpool who are responsible for um, the identification of talent, and as everything is going well there, those people are getting um, a little bit of um, pop in the media. We haven't really had that from the Manchester United uh, scouting department before, and I wonder if if that might actually help Solskjaer if there was like a these are these people, this is what's happening, or maybe maybe we don't need that. I don't know. I, I think I wonder if we had a more open conversation about who those people were at United Solskjaer, and even just the the, the doubt about did he sign? Did he want Van de Beek? He was his third choice apparently. Is that good enough? Is actually is his third choice actually also going to be a brilliant player? All of those conversations I think would would. If there was a bit more transparency about them, I, maybe it wouldn't help at all. I don't know. Um, I mean, I don't. I, I see Van der Beek, and I certainly see someone who looks like he could be a brilliant player. But when he like, signed Aaron Wan Bissaka, he said they they, they, were, they briefed that they'd looked at 17 million fullbacks, the analytics team, and they looked at 17 million fullbacks, and they decided that the one who everyone knew was good, who played in the Premier League, was the one that they signed. I think the thing with Liverpool is they're too, they do seem to have a really good team who are doing a really good job of finding good players and finding value. Uh, I think what they also have is they have the best manager in the world. So you sign a player and Klopp will make it work. So I think there's also that. And when you join Liverpool now, you're coming into a team that's playing really well. The only pressure that is on that player is the pressure that the player puts on themselves to do well. If the player fails, Liverpool is still a brilliant team. And with United, that isn't the case. They're signing players, and the players that are right that arrive are expected to elevate the team significantly. And so they signed Bruno Fernandes, and that happened. He did it. But expecting that of players is is difficult because, especially when you've got players who are moving countries, who are adjusting to a new league, who are adjusting to a new life, to then come in and have a significant impact in a difficult league in a team that isn't quite there yet is very demanding and most people cannot do it. So when you come in at Liverpool, you're coming into very different circumstances to when you come in at United. You're not coming to play for the best manager in the world who will, who's, inspires everyone that comes into his orbit. It's a different kind of thing. So, yeah, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's, it's harder to come to play for United than it is to come and play for Liverpool. So you, Liverpool signed Diogo Jota and he turns up and he's, playing better than he's ever played before in his life. And it's not hard to construct a story as to why that is. He already knows the Premier League. He's already happy in England. He must be, or else he'd have left. And he's not. If, if Diogo Jota comes in and he fails, what happens? Not that much. So for him to come in into a fully functioning team, he, all he's really doing, he's got the inspiration of playing for Klopp, playing for Liverpool and playing for his place. Yeah. So that's it. Whereas you come in and you play for United, you've got to come in and you're expected to make the team better. And there's not the same level of confidence and cohesion 
within within the group. So it's a very different thing. Okay. I, how concerned are you about the fairly constant stories around Mason Greenwood? Uh, quite concerned, but not extremely concerned because if you if we all think back to when we were 19 uh i don't know about you but i think it's probably a fair assumption to make that i mean i know i was something of a moron without the aggravating features of talent fame and money so for mason greenwood to be let's say he is something of a moron i don't think that is a massive stretch because as i said i was everyone i knew was we all were so for him to have some difficulties adjusting to coping with his talent, coping with the money, coping with the fame, coping with the pressure at a time like it, a time when there's a pandemic on, I'm not staggered by this. And I think the things that he's meant to have done are not dreadful. And I'm sure that United will give him everything he needs to succeed. And if it works out that he doesn't, then he won't. But we saw with Ravel Morrison, like what happened to Ravel Morrison is obviously a tragedy in terms of his personal tragedy and not fulfilling his talent and you, how that might affect him later in his life when he has a chance to look back. But the things that are bothering Mason Greenwood are not on the same level as the things that were bothering Ravel Morrison. So, and Ravel Morrison still almost made it. So yeah, I think Mason Greenwood will be okay, but I'm not especially surprised at if the stories we hear about him are true. Uh, and I would be more surprised if they ended up properly hampering his career than if they didn't. I think the chances are that we'll see Mason Greenwood go on to be everything that Mason Greenwood should go on to be. Well, hopefully hopefully that's correct. And, and like they do have people at the club who can talk to him on his own level, who are a little bit older, who've been through some of the stuff that he's been through. And I don't know if him and Rashford are mates or whatever, but like they can at least ask him to go and help and say, look, you know, I, I have experience with this. It, it's maybe worth, um, I, we did want to briefly chat on the, the international windows here. Um, I think Jack Grealish could be player of the year. He, he's, he's close enough with, if there was a 10 game stretch now before the voting happens in January, February, where he maintains the form that he's had for the last three or four weeks, then he's going to start getting a little bit of um, discussion in that realm. And there is somebody who has had his issues off the field and who took a little bit of time because the weight of the entire city was upon him uh, carrying their football team uh, to mature. And I don't know, maybe he hasn't actually matured off the pitch. I mean, you know, we don't know yet, but certainly his performances on the pitch suggest this is somebody who's cresting to some kind of peak. Um, what, what do you make of where Grealish is at the moment? And, and just briefly about the England team, like they're good enough to win the Euros. That's what the expectation level should be. Uh, yeah, I think that um, well, the main difference we're seeing with Jack Grealish last season and this season is really is John McGinn, um, who is also a, a really, really great player. Not great as in like the greatest of the era, but just someone who great as in good and effective and all the things you would want a midfield player to be. And funnily enough, every time I watch Villa, the season that they got promoted, it was McGinn who stood out, not Grealish. Now you're talking like five or six times. So, and I know that Grealish was the best player in that division, according to people that watched every game. That's what the Villa fans say too. McGinn, 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 McGinn not Grealish. And then Grealish did something amazing. Like, yeah, yeah, but look at look yeah, yeah, McGinn yeah. did. That's Grealish. And that's it. It's the <clears throat> grit. McGinn, I know Fergie loves McGinn as well. But just every time I watch McGinn, what McGinn gives you is he gives you energy. He gives you edge. He wins the ball. He passes it really well. He gets forward. He scores goals. And having that taken away from Grealish made Grealish's job much harder because I think that it sort of probably forced Grealish out to the wing a bit more than he might have been there because that was what he needed to find the platform to perform. Whereas he's now, he's now got a bit more scope because behind him, he's got McGinn. Uh, he's also got Conta, who's the like, Villas' two centre-backs playing really well and they've got a really good platform to play. I still think that, I mean, if we're talking actual player of the year at this point, it would be very difficult to look beyond Harry Kane, who is... It's just an absolute phenomenon. But Grealish, I think Grealish is still, if you look at the England team, you wonder where you might fit Grealish in. But I agree that England could definitely do something in the Euros. I'm not entirely sure I trust Gareth Southgate to find the best way of picking the best 11 from the players that he has. And they do still have concerns in the middle of the defence and at the back of midfield. But going forward... England have the players to absolutely rinse any team and and they have options. They don't just have three good attackers, they have five or six good attackers and 
doing something. No team will look forward to facing England. No defence will look forward to facing England. The question is how they balance the rest of the team. I'm just, I was just looking at the squad earlier, just before I came in, and I was thinking, and I was trying to kind of put together an eleven that I thought would work. And uh, I don't think it's an eleven. And I was because I was kind of thinking if you could play, say, Reese James at right back, he would give you not quite as good delivery as Trent Alexander-Arnold, but he's a miles better defender. And then you could think about using Trent Alexander-Arnold in midfield, where you might have a weakness. And then if you perhaps put Bukayo Saka into midfield as well and then matched it with some legs, whether it was Declan Rice or Jordan Henderson, you're starting to find the team that could do something because you've also got Phil Foden to put in there. And you're starting to find the midfield that would be able to outplay a team. Whereas previously with England, with, the, with this squad, you look at it and you've got, well, you could cane any team on the counter, but... That England didn't necessarily have the midfield to outplay the best teams. And they still might not. I mean, it's still hard to see. It's still hard to look past France. Obviously, in international tournaments, in any tournaments, that these what eventually will come down to a one-off game where if your good players play well, you can win. But France still are... France is still, I think, quite a long way ahead of everyone. And catching them is between now and then is difficult. Uh, and you've also got you've got Italy who are improving quite quickly, and Germany still have loads of really good players. Spain are a mess. That midfield sounds decent, but I don't think it would uh, rinse a Harrah and McCarthy Hendrick triumvirate somehow. <laughs> no, no, that's true. I mean, uh, yeah, uh, Ireland also have have all of that. But... Well, we'll see. We'll see on Thursday night. I mean, that does sound like a pretty good team that you've just uh, outlined there. And all of a sudden, I'm a little bit scared about what might happen. Daniel, good stuff. Thanks a million for joining us. No, I see you again, guys. It's Daniel Harris giving us some thoughts on. Um, uh, well, that was actually a scary England team that was um, outlined there. Luckily, they've got no good uh, centre back, so uh, you know what you get with one hand from the sporting gods, they take with the other. Well, yeah, they're talking obviously talking about the exact same issue that we have, which is what to do with your uh, incredible wealth of right backs. And he's obviously suggesting put Trent into midfield and start Reese James. Obviously, James is having a phenomenal season for Chelsea, and you've got the the slight matter of Kyle Walker as well. Uh, who could probably stay on the left, and uh, if that, that's their that's their solution to that problem. Play three five two, just play yeah. three five two. If only you had three three good centre backs. Right, seven minutes past eight this morning. We're way past late, uh, late way later than we should be. OTBAM live in association with Gillette. Uh, good morning. Start with Gillette, giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. Uh, plenty more to come. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with the uh, power rankings. We have um, loads more coming too. Stay tuned. OTB. AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. Off the ball. For people to look at Roy Keane and say they're not going to take him because of what he might say as a pundit is ludicrous. It's ridiculous. How are you not going to have a player like that, a, a, a manager like that who's, who's had the career he's had, and not try and tap into that to help your team? They're missing a trick. All of them who's not taking them. Missing a trick. Off the ball. Weeknights from 7 and weekends from 1. This is OTB Sports Radio. Live 24-7 on the OTB Sports app. Bet smart this season with Stat Betting on the Boyle Sports app. For the first time ever, bet on shots, shots on target, tackles, passes, assists and more, all powered by Opta. Why not check out the hottest action on the biggest game of the week right now on the Boyle Sports app. Boyle Sports. This is betting. Need help? Contact gamblingcare.ie 18 plus. OTB AM With Gillette, proud supporters of Movember. Gentlemen, let's move. OTB AM Right, a very quick look at the morning papers for you. OTB uh, Sports.com, Ronan O'Gara and Jacob Stockdale. You can't give up on them. I think that's probably the only option, isn't it? You've got to get them the minutes at fullback and let him play through this. Uh, Roy Keane can get away with that kind of comment, but it affects players. It's Pat Nevin talking about um, Roy Keane calling Kyle Walker an idiot. One team played without fear, the other were afraid to lose. It's Darren O'Sullivan on last night's off the ball. Aaron Connolly vents frustration at social media reaction to Seatgate. And uh, Shelburne condemned to playoff as Dundalk cling on to Europe. Um, Aaron Connolly hasn't, you know, he's very like, look, it wasn't my fault. I moved seats, I could have got it from somebody else. It's like, there's always like a, it's always somebody's responsibility somewhere along the line, isn't it? Like, I don't know. We're not going to the Euros. The Euros now, because of the vaccine, are probably going to be pan-European and it's going to be loads of crowds and it's going to be great. We're going to miss the party. That's all I'm saying. The Star, bring it on. 
Uh, Robbo says Cop can cope with schedule. Andy Robertson, pretty happy about life. McGinley, Rory, not up to task. We'll talk about that in a little bit later. Connolly wants a Wembley rewrite. That England team that uh, we just were talking about there, they're like pretty good. That's an amazing group of players that they have. And if they blow this now, uh, Garcia ruled out a Masters after testing positive. Vaccine hope for fans return. That's the one that I think is uh, going to be the main story for the next while. We've got the uh, Irish in our Irish Times. Uh, Cork have blown this championship wide open, but will they be able to kick it on from here? We're about to find out. Where will Cork be in the power rankings? We're minutes away. The Daily Mail, we've got this. Connolly's not faced by Ireland's scoring burden and hail the Invincibles, an unbeaten season from Shamrock Rovers to uh, win the shortened league title, which puts the League of Ireland in a pretty good spot. You've got them, you've got them Dock, you've got some other teams doing well at the moment, so uh, fingers crossed there'll be proper rivalries at the top, Bowes as well. Uh, I want to be an icon. Can I get it there? Connolly, icon, you get it? Uh, virus hit surgery to Miss Augusta. Big Six wants new vote on five subs rule. That's... Uh, we've spent all this money on getting players in. You won't let us use them. What's going on? We can use them in European competitions. Garcia's out of the Masters is the Guardian. Iceland at Wembley in doubt. COVID-19 rules may compel England to switch to Albania. Germany was another possible one for that. Uh, the uh, chief executive of Flutter, which runs Paddy Power and Betfair, has called for the gambling laws in the UK to be updated to take account of the in um, improved technology. Um, the Sun... Seat and sour, Aaron frustration at COVID controversy, backlash on social media was not fair. Missing playoff semi a huge regret. I'd say it will be. It must be. It was a big opportunity for him. He was in great form at that stage. The Times, the London Times, Germans may host England. Garcia streak ended by COVID, and the Herald is the same. They've got a picture of Brian Howard there who didn't play, didn't start at the weekend for the Dubs. That's how good Dublin are at the moment. Uh, the Indo, I have a point to prove, Johnny Sexton. Um, that is Sligo goal scorers Ronan Coughlin and Jesse Devers celebrating after their victory over Dundalk which gives them a chance of European football Connolly fires back at frustrating plain seat critics and uh, Kingdom to keep faith with Keane there's no no. he's in the middle of a three year uh, term so there's no risk of that job not being his is the essential one there and I'd be surprised if Rory really raised a gallop this week is one of the stories from the examiner um, right that's the papers for you at 12 minutes past eight. It's time for the power rankings. We shouldn't wait any longer. Let's get to it. This next slot is our power ranking slot, which has um, become known as two pricks, one lift. B-O-L-L-O-C-K-S. Go with fancy dance. Get the simple things wrong. A nice team. Only one an answer for that. Where did this ferocious determination out there today come from? The media. Every one of them brought us off. The, the article was rubbish. You know, it's, it's not my fault that this hadn't been carrying in a big game in Cook Park. I'm going to lose what we like. It is time for um, the power ranking with Owen Sheehan. Owen Sheehan's power ranking. How did that happen? You're a clown. The most hotly anticipated power rankings of all time, Owen. Yeah, speak for yourself. Speak for yourself. This is uh, horrific, putting this together today. A lot of bad things have happened over the last couple of days and um, you know I guess we all have to do our bit for the cause and following these things through people have climbed Everest people have climbed Kilimanjaro with a weight on their back but putting these power rankings together this morning obviously is a much tougher task than all of that uh, let's start at number 32 as ever Sligo at the bottom they couldn't fulfill the fixture at the weekend and that for me puts you immediately at the bottom of the fixtures London are ahead of them at 31 no London didn't play any fixtures this year still not fulfilling a fixture puts you right down to the bottom. Are you waiting in? Are you are you siding with the players? Are you against the county board? Do you believe the Connacht Council? Are you, do you want to wade into that controversy and, and use classic uh, diversionary tactics or should we just horse through this part of the list? This power rankings is all about Sligo. No, I'm just joking. Sligo, 32. London, 31. Waterford, up to 30. 29 is Carlo. 28 is Antrim. 27 is Lau. 26 is Wexford. And 25 is Leitrim. In 24th place, we've got Wicklow after getting hammered down two places. We've got Limerick staying where they are in 23rd. Offaly are down to 22nd. Longford are down to 21st. And Derry are up four places to 20th. I told you last week that they were just down in 24th temporarily. Uh, Limerick, Offaly, uh, Longford, Julie got defeated, and Wicklow as well. So Derry are back up where they belong in the top 20. Fermanagh, number 19. Westmead down to 18th. Clare down to 17th. Because down or up two places to 16th. An impressive win over Fermanagh at the weekend. In 15th place, staying where they are. 
Tipperary getting the job done in very tight circumstances against Limerick. So they'll stay where they are. Hang on, sorry. Who, who the down beat? Fermanagh. Right. And who the tip beat? Limerick. Right. So why would... Uh, who's ahead? Like, so Fermanagh way ahead. You should... The Derry should be ahead of tip at the moment. They should be. Sorry. Stick what? the list back up. Stick the list back up. Down should be ahead of tip at the moment. They've beaten a higher ranked team. There's no, there's no, there's no consistency here. Oh, keep going though. I'm not going to get bogged down in this. We've got to get to the best bits. Kildare number 14. Kildare or Kildare number 14. Leash number 13. Monaghan. Kildare should be higher. Place. They're, they're still in the championship. They're better than Cavan. Oh look at you! All of a sudden, uh, tooting your Kildare coloured horn. All of a sudden. Better like, than Monaghan. This, this, you, you, try, you tried to disassociate yourself from Kildare no, GEA no. like uh, 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 an issue in the family for recent months. So don't come at me with no, no, Kildare should be higher no. in the list. Uh, Monaghan down to 12th. Uh, Cavan down to 11th. Me, they're up to 10th. Are you happy? Me, people, I'm sure you are. Being a top 10 team in the power ranking seems to be the only thing that obsesses you every single week. How about going and actually contending in the Leinster Championship this year? Maybe then you'll actually go higher. But look, have it, number 10. Good luck. Congratulations. Armagh down one place into ninth. Let's get into the top eight. Galway down one into 8th place, Roscommon down 1 into 7th place, Tyrone down 1 into 6th place, Kerry down 3 in 5th. Out, out of the top 3, down to 5th, down to let's, just leave, let's just linger on this so everybody can, and can get this in, right? A, a few mistakes you've already made, I don't know why Roscommon are still in the top 8, that was, that was a, a very, very disappointing performance from them, they didn't lay a glove on a Mayo side that they have caused trouble for in the last couple of years. The best team in the country, according to you. But, Mayo, but, but the best team in the country. They should have been number one a couple of weeks Ross ago. Ross Common didn't even start a fight. They didn't even start a fight. So I don't think they should be in your top eight anymore. I think, actually, I probably did cabin a service. They're still in the championship. They should, they should be higher. Ross Common needed to come out of your top eight. They also need to be behind Galway, who are still in the championship at the moment. By default. But look, if Galway had the game against Sligo, you would have put Galway ahead of Roscommon. I think they're being unfairly punished. If Galway had any kind of a run out last week against Sligo, they would be ahead of Roscommon. They're still in the championship. They shouldn't be getting penalised for this. And we don't know what's going to happen with this they're Galway team. They're not getting penalised for this. They're not getting penalised for this. The only reason that they're down is because of who's in fourth place, because there's obviously been a massive jump into fourth. I'm not sure if you want to get into that. I'm happy to let's just go, leave let's it go, here. Let's go. And let's yeah. just kill the slot right now. Okay, fourth place, uh, Cork up five. Stop well done, Cork. I hope, I hope you're happy, Cork. Fair play to you. You won one game. Let's see how far you go. Uh, number three is Donegal. Uh, Mayo up to, to, to second place. And uh, the Dubs are number one because the Dubs are going to hockey everybody by 17 points. And maybe, we let, maybe let's just kill this. And let's, should we start previewing to see if Dublin can do the seven in a row, maybe? No, I think we need um, to just um, stick, the, stick the list back up from here because I just need to see this, right? So Dublin are one, Mayo are two, Donegal are three, Cork are four, and Kerry are five. This is a Kerry team who started the year with pretense of winning in All-Ireland with the, like, actually, you know what, last year in the All-Ireland, if, if we had realised that the dubs were down to 14 men and their goalkeeper was out, maybe I could have just scored a goal from the halfway line and it would have been one of those most famous goals of all time. But here they are, fifth on the power ranking zone. That's, that's, that stings. Cork are ahead of them in the power rankings, even though we know if that game was played 99 times out of 100, what would have happened? Kerry would have won. I just can't wait for next year, really. We're going to have a vaccine. We're all going to be uh, juiced up on the mRNA uh, at uh, Parky Cueva or Fitzgerald Stadium watching that 15-point hammering in favour of Kerry happen. But sometimes you just have to hunker down and actually just uh, accept the reality of the situation, which is Cork were the better team on Sunday. And as a result of that, I have to give them their dues on, on the power rankings list. There will be a tendency, of course, to say that Kerry... Uh, came closer last year to winning the All-Ireland then Cork will come to the winning the All-Ireland this year. There's, there's no question about that. And maybe as a result of that, they could have hung on to a place above them. But to be honest with you, I actually value my own safety. Cork isn't far from here. Uh, I would honestly be worried of being picked up and brought to a place and being taken away and disappear, basically, if, if I'd done that. So, uh, Cork, congratulations. I hope you're happy. You're into fourth. That's how I see the top four being. I, I think that's the, going to be the semi-final lineup. Cork, Donegal, Mayo, Dublin. And that's by favouritism for the All-Ireland in that order. I think Dublin will win the All-Ireland. I think they'll beat Mayo in the final. I think Cork and Donegal will be the losing semi-finalists. I do suspect that a shock might happen somewhere along the line, but I'm calling it right now. They're the, the top four. So this is predictive as well as uh, a kind of a, a mark of reality of what we've seen over the last couple of weeks. Everything else you're saying is complete nonsense. Like about Ross Common getting promoted to Division 1 in unbelievably impressive fashion. Galway getting absolutely hockeyed by Mayo. I can only judge what I've actually seen and I've seen uh, results between these teams over the last few weeks. So Galway be the most exciting team in the country before lockdown? 
Like, we've seen that. That's evidence in this season. Like two years ago. <laughs> it's actually this year. I realised that, you know, time is a flat circle and it got a bit gloopy and everybody went Tiger King mad. didn't exist last time Galway were good. No, this is true. Well, he did. We just didn't know about him. And they were happier times for all of us. Uh, I just wanted to um, talk briefly about a point you made yesterday on the show that you thought Tipperary were going to give it to Cork all, all day long in the Munster final. And actually, you didn't think yesterday that uh, it was going to be a straightforward Cork versus Mayo All-Ireland semi-final. You thought one of those two I teams suspect, was going to be beaten. I, I, I suspect it's going... I, I've got a, a feeling. I've, got, I've just got a feeling at the pit of my stomach. But so, this, as we all know, this is information. This is based on my head. This is knowledge. This is, okay. this is the correct okay. power rankings. I, I, I don't trust myself. So what you and, say on Monday, you don't back up on Tuesday in your power rankings. I just want to establish that as fact. You, you, you have a, you have, you're riding both horses here in a two-horse race. That's fair enough. I understand. I'm, you're, I'm sure you've got a feeling that Kildare might win a Leinster Championship. I'm sure Mead people have a feeling that they might win the Leinster Championship. I, I, think, the Dubs will be in the, I think the Dubs will beat Kildare in the Leinster final. I have a feeling they might, be, they might turn a very cocky Mead team over uh, this weekend. You know, Mead just Mead ran the score up. That's always a good look in a uh, Leinster Championship match. Let's get that sixth and seventh goal, just in case anybody doesn't realise that we're better than Wicklow. That always, you know, and then training this week, everybody's buzzing. And then you, if, if Kildare are as well organised as we think they are and they have some forwards who are kicking the ball over the bar, then look, this is where Jack O'Connor, that this is where all of his um, years of experience are, are, this is where his wiliness is now going to be useful. Or not, we'll see. It's a big game this weekend. Because they were up well against Offaly and then let them back into it. Just like they were up well against Cavan and let them back into it in the league. And just like they were up well in the first league game, which I've forgotten. Um, so there's a... I don't know if it's a, a tiredness or a conditioning or if it's a, just a, the lack of concentration. But anyway, that's not the story. The story is the humiliation of Kerry at the hands of Mark Keane with his first... And as we've so far, we think only kick in senior uh, inter-county football. Mm. Um, as the post-mortem has gone on, 24 hours more. Were you tuned to Radio Kerry last night or could you not bring yourself to? No, we, we actually had it on while having dinner last night. That this is the sort of uh, suffering that must be endured while, uh, while going through uh, a defeat, uh, like a week with this sort of defeat. It was actually more positive than you might think. Like, I mean, the, I guess there's enough blame to go around. There was, there's players who are being blamed. There are uh, members of management who are being blamed. Everybody has, at one stage or another over the last 48 hours, had a finger firmly pointed in their direction. So what he can do is throw the baby out with the bathwater and call everything, just play the under-20s next year and, and their management. Or he can actually address what's gone wrong within the camp and try and make everybody that bit better and everybody that bit more focused for next year. Surely, surely, that this sort of thing can't happen for a long, long time again. And I'm talking about being red hot favourites and losing a game like that, be, losing focus, losing the, the drive and hunger to actually beat your most ferocious rivals, people who believe that they are better than you. Like, let's not let's not shy away from this. Like, other than football, uh, Cork people probably believe they're better than Kerry people. Yes, uh, but not in football. In, in every other That's walk of life. So that, that should be motivation enough to keep uh, your foot on the throat and the one thing you think you are better than the match, the one thing you know you are better than the match, is football. You have to keep your neck on the throat yes. of Cork when it comes to football. Otherwise... Otherwise, Cork people will come along, dig trenches at the border and push Kerry out and Kerry will become an island and just float out into the middle of the Atlantic somewhere. This is the one thing that keeps us sane in Kerry is beating Cork routinely. It is the one thing that gives us importance in our corner of the world. The one thing where we can make jokes like the only good thing coming out of Cork is the road to Kerry and laugh at that, laugh at how funny we are, laugh at Cork. But not in years like this. And if you could pick any year in living memory, any year of the last 20 years for this defeat to happen, you would pick every year except for this. Because you just know that if there was a back door this year, you just know that if they got a second bite at that, they would have been in a much better position to beat the spread as you had put the money on at the weekend, to go and actually use that as a launch pad to, to win in All-Ireland, potentially. But not this year. There is no back door. We've gone back to the 90s because why not? Because yeah, you know, the hurling Hurl gets their, their, their back door uh, because they're special. Oh, uh, and football don't get their back door because who knows. Brent Pope has that great saying, never give a sucker an even break. And all Kerry did was give Cork an even break all of that first half when they had goal chance after goal chance after goal chance. When they were missing free after free, Cork must have been looking around going, geez, we're getting hammered here. What's the score? Oh, we're in front. Like it was, it was cognitive dissonance from the Cork people who were on the field going, 
doesn't feel like we're in this game. What's the score? Jeez, we're in front. That's amazing. And uh, I think it's because of you and your kin who were saying, geez, Corker, great, Corker, amazing. We, we, like, we need to be wary of this Cork team. You talked yourselves into it. Instead of just actually being calm and going, we're the superior force. We will outmuscle them, outthink them, outfight them, because that's what we do. We're Kerry. We're Kerry. You know the way Don Logue walks around going, we're Cork, we're Cork, and the Clare lads are, Jesus, this kid is over here. Apparently that's what happened in 99 in the, uh, in the Munster Championship match in the parade. Don Logue is going, we're Cork, we're Cork, and because Christy Ring used to say it. And so there's that heritage to fall back on. But for some reason, Kerry went away from their heritage of battering Cork and decided, oh, Cork, they're amazing. They're like... Dublin incarnate except younger and wearing red jerseys and they talked themselves into it and they gave themselves the fear instead of just being superior, better, calmer. And I actually legitimately think it has to do with the, I don't know why, it's the, the, the errorism, legitimately. I think that it has, a, it has an impact where you're like, ah, look, we've, we've got to take this Cork team seriously. No, you don't. You go out there and you kill them. You don't stop killing them until they're dead. And then you kill them again. When they're zombies, you shoot them through the heart again. The errorism doesn't exist in the Kerry camp. I, I, I don't like. I think it's something you develop as a period of time. If you're if you're talking about pundits, for example, if you're talking about people who who would, would have a platform, I think that's something you probably develop over a period of time. It's very, it's very rare that you would actually speak to somebody uh, in a camp, like obviously like uh, off the record or anything like that, and and think they're being defeatist about anything. Not like defeatist. The, it's the opposite. It's where you talk yourself. You, pr you prevent your own superiority. You, you're, you don't want to be seen as arrogant because you think that they'll, they'll pin it up at the dressing room wall and you take it too far to the point where you talk the opposition up so much you're like, actually, I've got it into my head now. I've, I've magic, my magic realism has become real. I've talked Cork into existence. Cork are a grand team, nice. No, no real badness about them, really, at this stage. A bunch of young, very talented kids who are coming off a very successful Division 3 campaign where they've had the opportunity to try out new stuff and grow and they clearly have a brilliant management team and they've got a bunch of players who are incredibly committed to it. But how many points in an All-Ireland final would <coughs> Dublin beat Cork by at the moment? In an All-Ireland final, where it's 12, not a semi-final 12, and they're not easing up. 12. 12. Um, they've beaten by 12 points. They, they're not a nice, like, I mean, they're not a nice team. That's what well, I don't think that's fair, first of all, on Cork. I think that they actually have a real edge to them. Like, we saw the, the sledging of Peter Crowley at the weekend, like uh, where, where was but like uh, this, for, but I'm not I'm not going down the, the path here of, of going after Cork for that whatsoever. Like they, they were punished for that, but I, if I'm a Cork fan, seeing that, I'm pretty happy to see that. I know they've given away a stupid free. It was a stupid free to give away, but okay. The, it, I, it, I mean, I'd like to see a bit more. I'd like to see yeah, a bit but more. Yeah, you Kerry as well. Not, you, you, you not want to see at least a response to that from Kerry. Like it's it, it's Crowley getting up, and when he gets up, there's still three Cork men around him. Like, where is the man, where's the enforcer there in that patch of grass who would come over and knock the Cork fella to the ground for roaring in Peter Crowley's face? Where, where is that age? And, and uh, where is that coming from? It, it's not something that we see too often from this Kerry team. I, I do think they are a little bit too nice. They've got phenomenal footballers, but I do think they're too nice. And I think that psychologically, there needs to be a lot of work done over the winter to actually get into a place where, and, and like maybe the, the psychology is a response to, what, to your perceived yearism seeping in, that actually getting a positive sense of superiority, but almost an expectancy that if things aren't going your way in a game, that you have a trigger, which is nailing your man, or which is laying down a marker in some sort of physical way to actually get yourself back into the game. Because but, while Kerry had what, missed, missed 18 scoring chances, it did feel that they were being dictated to at times during the game, which is mad considering the amount of scoring chances that they missed, that they could have actually won the game at a counter while not dictating the terms of engagement that much. Unless, it, it unless speaks, the scores would make... Kill, it, but, unless if they kicked those scores, you would have felt like they were dictating the terms. Because if, if, if Obiug Lee doesn't kick the ball at exactly the right height for the goalkeeper to save it, if he slides it in at the near post or slides it in on the ground at the far post or plays, takes, a, takes another hop and, or solo, whichever was appropriate, and plays the man inside for the hand-pass goal, then it feels like they're dictating the terms of play. So, you know, I, I wonder if that is actually a factor of the scoreboard, which is ultimately the reason why we play the game. Yeah. It's why, and, we, it's why we count the votes, because we want to see who wins. It's why we play the game. We need to see who's going to score the goals and score the points. <laughs> like, there's, uh, a, there's a very obvious thing about, like, the scoreboard dictating. I, I actually don't think Cork were the better team at the weekend. They were the team who scored the most 
over the course of the game and who made more from their chances. But I still think, like, clearly Kerry had the better footballers. As, as Tommy was saying in one of our chats yesterday, how many of that Cork team would actually legitimately start for Kerry? Maybe this week you'd, you'd start a lot more. But over the, the pace, of the, the course of four or five weeks, if these teams played every week, how many ultimately of those Cork team? Probably not that many. I don't think we overrated Kerry either. I think Kerry had a massive systems failure. That's not us overrating them. That's them needing to take responsibility for playing with fear at, in, in the, the biggest moment that this team could... But maybe, look, maybe this team, maybe Kerry go backwards and next year, Tyrone are going to be an absolutely massive force. This Mayo side are full of young lads, like, who could be brilliant for another couple of years. Galway will actually have a full season uninterrupted next year and they'll have mm. a second season manager who will be like, OK, OK, lads. Last year we were really close. Comer got injured at just the wrong time. Yo went out and wet the bed against Mayo in the league and we never recovered because we didn't get the opportunity to do it. All of a sudden it's very competitive. This might have been Kerry's year to capitalise on the momentum of last year and that's something that they need to think about over the winter. But I need to hear from you. Why, why did they play with fear? How could that team, supposedly unburdened by baggage, play with fear the way they did against Cork? Well, I'm not sure if they are unburdened by baggage. I think that there is a little bit of baggage from last year. Like, like I don't know, are people talking about this as a bolt out of the blue from Cork after the, the trouble they caused Kerry last year? I think that their system was brought in uh, as uh, a perfect remedy to Cork challenging them through the middle and scoring goals from runs through the middle. And Kerry felt that if they got their house in order, surely with the forwards they have, they can't possibly lose again against Cork. And like, I'm, I'm not sure if it is like the errorism seeping in and uh, like that sort of element of defeatism against Cork. I, I think it's actually because of they thought that if they stop Cork from scoring goals, everything else will look after itself. Did he pick his forwards though? Say that again? Did he pick his forwards? Well, I think, like, I mean, Killian Splank came off the bench and I think there was maybe, I think there's three real inside forwards in that entire squad on Sunday, which is kind of mad to say. Not, never mind the starting team, three inside forwards in the squad. Uh, Killian Splank came on uh, and Tony Brosson and David Clifford were the others. The rest of them are kind of half forwards. Obviously, you'd expect a bit more from Sean O'Shea from a, a scoring perspective, but you've got good runners, good defenders, fellas who are well able to kind of ride the tackle if, they, if they're running with the ball from deep positions, and that's what he's gone for. And I, I guess that is kind of a, a some sort of effort to try and bring more of a hardness and an edge to carry. But if you don't have the mentality to back that up, then it's probably going to, to fall flat. So I, I just think that maybe there wasn't enough work done on the attack or maybe not enough thought given to how they're actually going to break Cork down. Um, because all the efforts were on the defence. But then you can still counter that with saying, well, they did have kind of like a, a skills execution failure as well if they've left that much after them. Like how, how much more uh, could, could the system actually bring in terms of scoring opportunities for them? But like on the goal opportunity, like I've been saying it for the last few weeks, Kerry's goal scoring record is bad, very bad. Like Donegal, Tyrone, Mayo, Cork, all have, a, a, a Dublin obviously, have a better a goal scoring rate than them by a distance actually if you're looking at the championship if you're looking at it since the start of 2019 across all competitions Kerry have a worse goal scoring record than all of them they beat you by scoring 120 121 that's how Kerry win they don't beat you by scoring 412 whereas Dublin can do 412 or they can do 120 Kerry have one way of beating you and it's by scoring 22 scores it's death by a thousand cuts and there weren't a thousand cuts for them to take at the weekend no there was 11 okay last question uh, how good are Mayo Excellent, excellent, really excellent. I think it is going to be a, a Dublin Mayo final. And like what you talk about there with the use of Mayo as well, this is not just like we've, we've moved away now from the narrative around Mayo, which is one last hurrah. Can they do it? Can they go, can they go back to the well one more time? That narrative has completely disappeared from Mayo. There's a huge degree of hope around this Mayo team that if they end up losing yet another All Ireland final this year, it actually won't matter as much as it mattered in 2017, 2016, because this Mayo team are going to be stronger next year, you suspect. These young players look like they have the mentality for, for a championship football. They look like they can slog it out on a, on a tough uh, winter's afternoon. I know they lost their last game in the league, but you have to be unbelievably hopeful about this Mayo team. And the score they racked up against Galway was outrageous. Like, absolutely incredible. Not letting Ross Common get a peep at the weekend. A really good Ross Common team. And I, I do, in fairness, I do agree with you. I think Ross Common were desperate at the weekend and definitely should have been a lot better than they were. But I think Mayo deserve a lot of credit for this. And Killian O'Connor maybe doesn't get, like he definitely doesn't get hailed as much as Dean Rock, for example, despite it also being a record-breaking scoring forward. But to be a record-breaking scoring forward for a team that's not winning All-Irelands, 
the mentality that that takes to come back year after year after year and ratchet up massive scores and to do what he's doing from play, to do what he's doing as, without the ball in his hands this year as well, is seriously impressive. And if Killian O'Connor continues that pace and keeps fit, which has been a, an issue for him, then this Mayo team is is outrageously good. And like they, they've been somewhat forgotten in, in recent times and the hammering against Dublin last year was a hard one to take. But I think, really, if you want, as a neutral, and I know people will say this is anti-Dublin uh, bias or something like that, but in fairness, you kind of have to be a little bit anti-Dublin if you want a good championship sometimes. And if we want Dublin to get a game this year, um, to put it bluntly, we need Donegal to be their semi-final opponents and we need Mayo to be their final opponents because there's no one else in that list that are properly going to give them a game. All right, that is this week's power rankings in the books. It was a tough one for Owen to go through, but uh, he survived it anyway. 8.35 this morning, and I'm delighted to say John Duggan is here. John, good morning to you. How are you? Jaron Owen, how are things? I'm good. There's a vaccine. My team are still in the championship for at least another four or five days. And our Dublin, and our Clare. Great. And, uh, yeah, the vaccine, I, I just like, look, with any, you wake up, I remember seeing Fauci the other day in the States saying it'll be the end of 2021, and then you're seeing yesterday Pfizer coming out going as 90%. Good, so let's hope. Keep our fingers crossed. We'll have fans back in stadiums maybe next summer, next autumn. I think it could be before then. I mean, listening to the FT on the way in, they were saying that um, the speed at which this comes about, so it's going to cost 20 quid a shot. There, You need two shots, $19 a shot. You need two shots for it. So obviously it's quite expensive. But Pfizer can license this to other companies, which maybe they won't do because the technology is so bleeding edge. And you could uh, bang out millions and millions and millions and millions and by the end of like next summer, billions of samples. This shouldn't um, cost any money. This should be as free as it can be. This should be national service. This should be pure socialism about this vaccine. Look, uh, yeah, the drug companies need to get paid. The, the government's going to pay for that, and we ultimately end up paying that because it, through our taxes. So I agree with you. It should be free. Um, maybe those who can afford to pay should pay. I wouldn't mind paying 40 quid to... Yeah. Um, I wouldn't mind paying for my kids to get a vaccine. So I uh, certainly wouldn't mind paying for my folks to get a vaccine um, if we have to. But, uh, yeah, like, that could happen. We could have the Euros. The Olympic Games. I think the Olympic Games are probably more likely to happen than not now with this news. And uh, I'm just, it's exciting. And I just, when will Croke Park be the way Croke Park was again? I, look, this legitimately is a, is a question because it was one of the uh, suggestions in the paper. Where, like the league might start in March and then actually when they thought about it, perhaps what they'll do is they'll have the club championship first and then we could have all Ireland finals next October, November before full houses. Because by that stage, you should have um, most of the country vaccinated. That's a pretty exciting prospect. Absolutely be amazing. And it's interesting that the Premier League want a digital passport with the UK government so they can be first in line with concerts to come back in the UK because they're obviously so desperate to get fans back in there from a revenue model. So look, um, it's, it's very exciting and uh, let's hope this uh, continues in this way. And, and as well, all these other companies like AstraZeneca and Oxford uh, University, they've got other vaccines in, in train. Um, What's interesting about this vaccine is that uh, you, you're not actually injected with it. You're, you're just, uh, it's, it's quite, um, there's, a, there's a safety aspect to this Pfizer that I was reading about, which was quite promising. Um, so uh, hopefully that'll be a great escape for humanity. Um, and uh, speaking of escapes, uh, Finn Harps uh, surviving in the League of Ireland Premier Division uh, after winning three of their last four games. The Donegal side beating uh, Waterford 1-0 last night with a goal from Adam Foley. Shelburne now will face Longford Town at the weekend in the League of Ireland promotion relegation playoff. Uh, Shell's losing 2-0 to champions uh, Shamrock Rovers, uh, who finished the shortened season unbeaten. The first time since 1927, uh, team has gone through the league unbeaten, but can you really uh, say there's not an asterisk beside it? You probably have to say there is one. Uh, Dundalk securing European football uh, despite losing 2-0 to Sligo Rovers. Uh, Sligo's fourth place finish uh, could be enough for Liam Buckley's side to claim a Europa League spot uh, if one of the three sides above them in the table goes on to win the FAI Cup. Now elsewhere, Cork City drew one all with Derry City, unfortunately Cork going down. Bohemians 2-1 winners away to St. Pat's. Uh, the Republic of Ireland squad will continue training in Barnet today, ahead of the Thursday's international friendly with England at Wembley, and reported that form and training was the reason why Mason Greenwood was left out of the Manchester United squad uh, to face Everton at the weekend. So he's got a bit of work to do, I think, regarding convincing his manager that uh, he is fit and ready to go all the time when it comes to training and getting ready for matches because there's been a few stories to that regard in recent times. Um, look, it's the Masters on Thursday. We can't wait. We're going to build up to it uh, tomorrow on OTBAM and uh, across our social and digital platforms over the next few days. Um, so lucky to have it. 
Uh, the conditions are going to be very interesting. We got what, a few hours in the field chain, Larry back in form, the Cork amateur James Sugru talking in, uh, today about how much he's loving uh, driving up Magnolia Lane, Gray McDowell, and then Rory. Rory hasn't won a major in six years. And Paul McGinley, his uh, former Ryder Cup captain, not too keen on his chances. He's not trending well in any of his statistics, uh, particularly a strokes game approach, that important category when you're going into Augusta. If it had been a normal Masters in April without COVID, he was showing the best form he'd ever shown in his life. But the world has changed a lot and Rory McIlroy's game has changed a lot. Paul McGinley is never afraid. Now, it's his job with Sky and that, but he's never afraid to call it the way he sees it when it comes to Rory McIlroy. Yeah. What does McIlroy ever, ever pick up in this kind of stuff? Oh, he absolutely does. You, 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 you... Just you've seen recent examples of uh, books talking about how much of the media they read. Like um, we had Joe Schmidt in studio when we were allowed to have people in studio, and he was saying that they they did read all the stuff because it has an impact on the players and the supporters. And I personally, I think it's it's too much. And I think the the rugby team certainly took it to an extreme. In Rob Carney's book as well, he talks about being um, inspired slash driven by Gavin Comiskey. It, I thought that was mad stuff to be honest. I think. Um, you can be sure McElroy is aware of... Is this Michael Jordan then? Is it, oh, is it almost like they're looking for Michael Jordan motivations and slights well, that aren't Donnie, really slights? Donnie and Brawley, you know? Yeah. Like, um, in, in, in that instance, it worked out. Like, and look, maybe, maybe uh, the sports science can take you so far and the skill can take you so far and ultimately it is about a little bit of determination at some point that gets you in the zone. Um, I'm just not sure how it works in golf, but it is... I, it, well, look, Brooks like, Kepka has got a massive issue with everybody it's, uh, in the last few years. I'm going to prove everybody wrong. You don't show me enough respect, I'm going to win all these majors. So definitely it has been a thing for him. Yeah, yeah that's true. Although he won his first one and, like, he couldn't... Have, was he already at that stage peeved that people didn't... No, I don't think he got into the peeve until after Afterwards, that. yeah. yeah. And then, then he definitely used it. Is this, is this the old captain trying to... Give McElroy a, like a, a kick in the ass to to get him jizzed for the well, whole thing. Well, well, if I was McElroy, I hear a lot of this from McGinley, and I've heard a lot of this from McGinley just speaking quite starkly about McElroy's form. And if I was McElroy, I'd be going, "Okay, would you put a sock in it?" Um, if I was McElroy, and I'm not him, and he might think a completely different way. But maybe Rory doesn't need to get a bit angry. Um, I remember, like when I saw him in the ma in matches in previous years, the putting has been too streaky, and he'd rush his game at times with Harry Diamond. And maybe Rory just needs to go out there and have that swagger that he had a few years ago. I remember it was funny, the last major Rory won in 2014, he was, he was remember he was commentating about um, Mickelson and Fowler talking to each other, and he just said, I'm, he had that, I'm going to do you guys. You don't talk around the final round of the major. And maybe Rory does need to get a bit mad. Um, he was kind of talking in a jokey way, but the fact that he made the most birdies ever at the Zozo Championship, and he made a lot of mistakes, maybe he doesn't have to, need to get a bit angry rather than um, nervy, which he has been, say, recently. Yeah. Por Porosh being a classic example of that. But Butch Harmon, Tiger Woods' former coach, has a different view to McGinley. The last time he teed it up in the Zozo at Sherwood, he made more birdies than anyone else. He had a couple wrecks on a few holes. Those are just mental mistakes. I actually look for Rory to have a chance. I think he's one of the guys on the back nine on Sunday that's going to be there with a chance to win. And uh, I think Roy McIlroy has a really, really good chance to win his uh, Masters and finally complete the career Grand Slam. He's, uh, right, he's right about the fact that any time Rory McIlroy tees it up anywhere, he's got a chance. Yeah. Now, look, uh, this is going to be an early finish to the Masters, yeah. obviously, because it gets dark earlier at this time of year. I don't know, Owen, if you factor that into your uh, TV watching on Sunday. What time do we think the... It'll probably be teeing off, well, I'd say maybe 10 a.m. local time, so maybe 3 o'clock. It'll probably be... It could be 3 to 8 uh, window. Right. Nice. Yeah. It is nice. It's perfect, John. It's like... I, I mean, I'm not sure, are you luxuriating in all of this, John, or do you kind of like the Masters to be on a weekend where you can clear the decks and watch every stroke? I, like, I think sometimes golf is the hardest sport to actually watch on a dual screen because you need to be a little bit glued in to, to what's actually happening, unless you've got your phone there and keeping an eye on the scores. Well, we've got the Munster final on as well, which is an absolute mm. um, essential must-watch. Uh, look, the fact that there is a Masters in any way, I, I wrote in my column for the site there uh, on Sunday that any kind of distractions at the moment are keeping our minds off COVID. Uh, the election, I completely forgot about coronavirus. Obviously, you take all the pre pre precautions and you do all the things you need to do with washing hands and wearing masks and that. But I, for the first time, it, this didn't pervade my mind completely every second of the day, COVID. It was the election, the election, the election, the election. The Masters and the GA Championship will be that for me this week. And that's brilliant. Right. Uh, uh, no, just a bit of rugby news. Well, James Lowe expected to be in the Irish team, which Andy Farrell will name in midday for the Wales game on Friday. 
eligibility residency rules he's in. Jameson Gibson Park, interestingly, tipped in the Times to start with Ronan Kelleher coming back. Uh, Ulster winning 40 15 against uh, Glasgow last night in the Pro 14. And we can't forget that the jump season is back. Top of the game ruled out for the season. A real disappointment for Gold Cup fans. Uh, meeting over jumps at Ferry House today. The first off there, Jaron Owen, half 12. All right, John, thanks for that. It is 8 44 a.m. this morning here on OTBAM. Gillette have special Movember packs in store in Tesco. A donation will be made to charity for each purpose made. Head over to movember.com forward slash Gillette for more ways to get involved. If you don't fancy a tash, you can do something active. You'll get all the details there. We have some pictures for you, obviously, myself and Owen have us. Uh, so this is Adrian Barry. You can't really tell if there's anything there, is there? That's um, uh, the, the two, um, are they hoarders? What, what's that meme with the two guys shouting at each other? Is it, what, what's that? Uh, okay, well, we'll come back to that. <laughs> but sure. This one had to be in black and white because in colour you can't see it. It looks like he's bald. That's uh, the, the fair moustache of Shane Hannon. Um, you know the two old guys shouting, that's you there, Owen. Um, we can see it. Very good. <laughs> Did you give any, 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 any temptation? No temptation. People who didn't join us to uh, go in the full Adrian Barry and trying to get the handlebars out, biker style. <laughs> No, oh, like I, I will say, Adrian and I, and, and Shane, in fairness, are, are afflicted by uh, the colour of our hair. You know, it, do, it doesn't quite pop the, the facial hair, but you know, we get through it. I know yours creates a nice little shadow. Thank you, a nice little shadow. That's uh, that, that's that thickness right there, isn't it? A nice little shadow. Thank you very much. Right. Okay. Eight forty-five this morning. Get involved. Um, Movember.com forward slash Gillette. Send us your, uh, your crappy tashes after a week, or maybe they're luxurious and we'll be jealous, so you can send them to us as well. 0879-180-180 is the number. Now, let's turn our attention to hurling. The uh, qualifier draw last night, yesterday morning rather, was uh, pretty sensational, but maybe that shouldn't overshadow the fact that it is an absolutely giant weekend of hurling as well. Michael Verney is with us. Michael, how are you? Gents, how are you? You're, uh, you rock the tash the whole year round, do you? Not just from <laughs> November. I don't, I don't mean to, but I've got a bit of a Tom Selleck going on here, yeah. So, um, yeah, I don't, I don't mean to. It's not, on, it's not on purpose. It's more true laziness than anything else. Well, you could get away with it for an hour month and just a little bit of experimentation in life, you know. That's true. We, we might, we might give it an old go. Yeah, just, uh, I don't know. It's not the best. It's not the best look in York now. I get enough abuse about it anytime I do any sort of video or anything like that. So I try to stay fairly uh, freshly shaven. Uh, there are big stories in hurling this week. We might uh, finish with the, the gossip in, at the end, but before that, big games this weekend. Uh, what are you looking out for in Kilkenny against Galway before we get to the, the Munster hurling final? Uh, probably one of the, the biggest things about it is, is that Brian Cody's never lost uh, three Leinster finals in a row, and that will happen if, if Galway beat them on Saturday evening. So that's kind of a big one. If you're looking at... Uh, between Kilkenny and Galway whose need is probably greatest who actually needs to get their hands on silverware you'd probably say that it would be Kilkenny because uh, they've changed the side an awful lot in recent years there's a good few new faces in and while a Leinster title you couldn't have said five or six years ago that a Leinster title would mean that much to them uh, but it definitely would mean a lot to you know the, the likes of I don't think Paddy Deegan has a has a Leinster title Connor Brown who'll probably start wouldn't have one uh, John Donnelly probably doesn't have one there's a good few guys that are kind of nearly mainstays of a team now that don't have one and I suppose even you know Brian Cody has been there since the the autumn or the winter of 98 he's coming up against uh, Shane O'Neill who's obviously only been in Galway uh, a little under a year now so there's a fair a fair contrast there uh, based on the Wexford game you're kind of wondering how bad were Wexford that night and how good are Galway? Galway looked very, very sharp that night. Uh, I'm expecting a much uh, sterner test from Kilkenny on Sunday or on Saturday. And it's funny, even in bad times, Galway, uh, you know the way styles make fights, Galway just, Galway's style uh, just never seemed to suit Kilkenny. Even they beat them in, beat them in 05, obviously. They beat them in 12 uh, before Kilkenny got them back in the All-Ireland final. So there's always been uh, an interesting bit of needle between the two of these. So this, yeah, that that's a, it's a like it's a fairly jam packed Saturday, and that's kind of the icing on the cake on uh, on Saturday evening. Has I think sorry, go on. I was going to ask about Kilkenny's uh, new faces changing the style of play at all. Uh, yeah, no, I definitely would say I don't know if it's if it's their new faces that changed the style of play. I think like five or six years ago, if you remember back to the 2014 final, they were quite direct. It was long ball. It was win your own ball. Every forward has to be able to win their own ball. They've definitely moved away from that. 
Uh, they go through the lines an awful lot more uh, than they would have in previous years. They're trying to play a more kind of a possession game. It's definitely not as nuanced as maybe Limerick or uh, even a Wexford at times, but their style definitely has changed. That's just the nature of uh, even club hurling. Every nearly every club team in the country has changed. It's just so much more based on possession now because it's so hard to win the ball that you don't. You're not just going to strike at eighty or ninety yards and just give away the ball. Uh, which would invariably happen, especially with sweepers now. So Kilkenny have definitely uh, changed to a more possession-based style. Uh, not not as much as many of the other teams in the country, but definitely a lot more than we would have seen from Kilkenny down through the years anyway. They have to be thinking to themselves, they have an amazing chance this year because they're the one team who've really been able to, to stick it to Limerick over the last 18 months. Like That can't but create belief in the Kilkenny camp. Yeah, yeah, I'd imagine so. Funny enough, Cork would be the the other one that I would say have been able yeah. to stick it to stick it to uh, Limerick. It's funny as we're saying about the styles. Cork style just does not seem to suit uh, Limerick. I don't know if it's because of all the pace and all the kind of scoring forwards that they have. But similarly, Kilkenny probably set. It's it's, very, it's difficult to say that they set a template, but the way they out, were able to outwork and outmuscle, which you couldn't believe and believe yourself saying it probably outmuscle Limerick, and particularly in the first half of last year's All Ireland semi final. That'll give them great hope. Even when Limerick won the All Ireland the year before in eighteen, Kilkenny gave them an absolute cracker of a game down in Turles in the quarter final. So yeah, they will definitely be thinking that, and you have to look at the Munster final and probably think that Limerick are probably gonna are probably gonna win that. So if Kilkenny can win Sunday, they're only one step away from an All Ireland final, and they'd be avoiding Limerick in a semi final, which would be crucial. Yeah, if they if they like. Some people would say like that, you know, Kilkenny's, you know, best years or Cody's best years are, you know, going for the going for the five in a row or, you know, winning in eleven and twelve or winning in fourteen and fifteen. I'd go back and say that like his two best performances or two best results in recent years and in the last fifteen years even, were the eighteen league final where they wiped the floor with Tipperary with a totally new team and last year in the All Ireland semi final where they put it up to the best team in the country and they came out on the right side of it. So like I think it, it's too easy to look at, back at Brian Cody's achievements and say, yeah, all these All Ireland titles. I would actually say that last year's All Ireland semi final was probably the best performance that he got Kilkenny to deliver, and he'd be looking for a couple more of them. And if they were to play, Kilke- if they were to play Limerick again, they'd quietly fancy their chances. They've obviously marked Limerick's card after last year, but that would be you know, like that'd be an epic of a game if they got to meet again. So if Kilkenny can come through the front door. They, the possibility of meeting Tipper, or meeting Limerick would not be to an All Ireland final, which would be huge for them. Mm. Just, just to go back to something you said on, on Galway. Obviously, the Wexford game is an interesting one. You say people don't know how good Galway were or how bad Wexford were. I definitely think the tone in the aftermath of that game has been focused on how bad Wexford were. Do you think that Galway perhaps haven't got enough credit there, and and have we seen new things over the course of the, that seventy minutes that suggest that? Galway are going to get back to you know a proper All Ireland contender this year. Yeah, it's, the funny thing about Galway being a proper All Ireland contender, I don't think they were ever not a proper All Ireland right. contender. Like if you if you look at the the Dublin game last year, they were they were you know apart from you know a couple of Chris Crummy goals up in Parnell Park, they were it was looking like they were going to be true to a Leinster final, and then all of a sudden results conspired against them, and Wexford and Kilkenny drew, and all of a sudden they were dumped out of the championship. And I don't think anybody could have seen that coming. Even without Joe Canning last year, they managed to go out to Kilkenny and uh, go down to Northern Park and beat Kilkenny, which was an absolutely huge result. And it looked like they were going to get a result against Dublin and they were going to go through. All of a sudden, they were out. Uh, in 2017, they were All-Ireland champions. In 2018, they were Leinster champions and they were beating All-Ireland finalists by a score. Uh, it was a one-point hammer and fair enough against Limerick, but they were still only beaten by a score in the All-Ireland final. So I don't think they've gone away. Largely, the same personnel involved. Uh, you know, the mainstays of the team, Gerald McInerney, uh, Parik Mannion, Cottle Mannion, Joe Canning, they're all still there and they've probably unearthed a couple more as well. Conor Whelan is becoming even more of a force in nature as, as time goes on. Brian Concanon, who had been delivering kind of bits and pieces, he looks like he's developed into a really, really good forward. He looks like he's bulked up an awful lot. Uh, Wexford couldn't handle him that night. Shane Cooney has come in from St. Thomas's. Anna Murphy has come in in goals. They have plenty of new faces, but still with all those experienced faces around the field as well. Fintan Burke is another one as well. A real kind of uh, halfback in the style of Potty Matt, a real powerful bursting out with ball so they've got plenty of new faces there mixed mixed with the old I don't think they were ever gone anywhere 
Um, and just the fact that even amidst all the turmoil with Mihal Dunhu leaving and Shane O'Neill coming in, they held on to Lucas Kersenstein, the, the S&C coach. So that's one of the big things. While styles of play will change, at least they were still doing the same strength and conditioning program uh, under the eyes of probably one of the most coveted strength and conditioning uh, professionals in the game. So I don't think they've gone anywhere. Uh, if they can win Leinster, obviously, on Sunday as well, they're only two, two uh, wins away from winning the All-Ireland too. But... They have a nice blend now. They have a nice blend of the the old and the new, and uh, they're definitely dangerous. And that's yeah, that's going to be an intriguing game Saturday evening. What's the truth about where Limerick are at the moment? Um, probably a good bit of head ahead of everybody else, I'd say, just because they seem to be able to deliver this unbelievably high level of performance despite uh, weather conditions, despite everything, despite maybe not having, you know, even against Clare, despite not having a game under their belt, they're still able to deliver this unbelievable performance. They're unbelievably versatile. You see Kyle Hayes going back, wing back the other day, and fair enough, he wasn't unbelievably influential against Tipperary, but the fact that they're able to move a centre-forward to wing back and he's comfortable there, and that they're able to put Keane Lynch in centre-forward and he's able to dictate the game um, they're really, they're the, probably one of the great examples of being a sum of their parts. Everybody just fits in uh, into their different roles and they just, the engine just keeps moving in perfect sync. And even a couple of new faces in the full back line don't really seem to have upset things at all because all the parts are still the same around them. Um, yeah, like that, that, that's an interesting game in the sense that Waterford delivered a real good performance against Cork now. Again, what sort of resistance did Cork put up that day in the Munster semi-final? But Waterford were brilliant. They have loads of new faces with, with Liam Cahill and uh, Mikey Beavens on the line and the likes of Callum Lyons and Conor Prunty uh, in their team and all their old faces as well in Austin Gleeson, and Jamie Barron. They're all kind of back on form, even though they're missing Parik Matney. And uh, that's, going, that's a tough game for Waterford. I think, I think as long as they're competitive and they deliver some sort of a performance, they'll be happy. I don't think they'll be expecting to win it. And with the way Limerick are playing at the moment, I'd say they are probably head and shoulders above everyone at the moment. But saying that, they were head and shoulders above everyone last year as well, and they were still caught. So there's still probably a bit of hope uh, for everybody there. But they just look like they have a bench to come in that's just... I'd say the envy of every team in the country. They've all these, like basically, as Jim Gavin used to always say, they've all these finishers to come in. Likes of David Dempsey, Conor Boyle, and uh, David Reedy. They have lads to come in all over the pitch. Seamus Flanagan as well. So they do look a step ahead, of everyone. But there is that bit of caution. I'd say that they were a step ahead last year of everyone, and they still managed to get caught too. All right. What about um, Davy and Wexford? Obviously, <laughs> like the drama of um, Davy against Brian Lowe, and like the story of that relationship is is unbelievable like it's it's uh, again type of hollywood scripting that if you read it you'd be like that's nonsense and here they are pitted against each other in a very important match for both teams because like we're hearing that there's all sorts of um, county board issues in clare and what that next uh, regime is actually going to look like whether or not it's part of the old regime and then uh, from davy's perspective we don't know if if the next game is going to be his last game or if he's definitely going to come back next year there was some suggestion he might be coming back next year irrespective so a lot riding on this oh uh, yeah um i think a lot of the the, Cla- the locals in clare just this was the this was the draw that was going to come up there was no question of whether they were going to draw cork or tipperary it was written in the stars that this would happen uh it's obviously davy going back to like there's only him and him and Gerlach Nan really and uh and all Ireland back in the in the early nineteen hundreds, they're the only two managers in the last hundred years that have that have helped Clare to win an All Ireland. And now Davies obviously was kind of left Clare under a cloud. Now he's over Wexford and he's going back to face Clare. And it just so happens that in the opposite corner is, you know, his old kind of lieutenant, a full back in Brian Lawn, a man who they probably spilled blood together for Clare and had so many good times and now They've kind of got a fractious kind of relationship. Uh, very, very interesting. The cameras will obviously be focusing a lot on the sideline battle. And I think that's what probably makes it so interesting as well, is that it's 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 almost like the sideline battle like nearly supersedes everything that happens on the pitch. And that's just the nature of it. Um, because the, it was goalkeeper and full back uh, looked almost, you know, in they were you couldn't think of Claire, you couldn't think of Lohan without Davy, you couldn't think of Davy without Lone. They were just kind of interchangeable duo, one and three. And the events of a uh, Fitzgibbon Cup match, I think it was in 2014, when uh, when Davy almost ambushed 
ambushed UL. I remember LIT, the LIT lads coming in through the bushes. I was down there on uh, pitch one in UL that the LIT were supposed to obviously come and get and get togged out and warmed up in UL. They didn't want to get warmed up in the UL dressing room, so they did their own warm up and they got togged off on the bus and came in through the trees at the back of pitch one in UL. It was actually uh, a bit surreal. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. It was really, it was just one of these mad things. I'm, I'm glad I was there for it because I've never seen anything like it before or well, since. Because no one would have believed you if you weren't. Like, that yeah, was no, the that, thing. That's, like, yeah, it's true, yeah. You, you wouldn't have had, and, like, obviously, LIT had their warm-up done already, so they were happy. They were just getting a few shots off or whatever, but they were literally standing in the middle of the UL warm-up and running around all the UL lads. They were all warming up the same end. And it totally, uh, that was the UL side, absolutely star so the side, uh, just off offhand, Podge Collins, Johnny Glynn, and loads more lads. And uh, I think LIT was something like seven or eight to one to win that game and ended up winning that game, coming over to UL. And it was just a really kind of a fractious game. Uh, tensions were running really, really high. And Brian, I know Brian Lowe was really put out over that. And then obviously when Davey was manager of, of Clare and even when he was manager of Wexford, you know, Lowe and called for a root and branch analysis of, of Clare hurling and the Clare County Board and all this kind of crack. And, made some comments last year even about Wexford and didn't like the style of play that Wexford had and it's just they're they're butting heads now on the line on Saturday and it just makes it it make it's a part it's a great start to it's a great start to a weekend where we're absolutely blessed with like four really, really, really high caliber games and the sideline battle is definitely going to be one of the main talking points between the two of them. Yeah, will they shake hands? Who's gonna win that one? Uh I, I think Wexford were too bad to be true against Galway and like if they go back to anything like the form of 2019, I'd expect Wexford to win that. Clare really, really limped over the line against, against Leash. You know, they lost the man, they lost Evan McInerney, expect him to be back for this game. But I'd expect, uh, I'd expect Wexford to bounce back in that one. OK. Um, are there other... Have I missed one? Did I miss the other qualifier at the weekend? Oh, yeah. Oh, Tipperary. Yeah. Like, How so could you forget? Are Cork, are Cork back? Like, Tommy Walsh said he wanted to see the forwards blocking and hooking and tracking back. And there was a bit of it. I don't know if there was enough of it, but there was a bit of it. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely massive work rate up the other day. Even Luke Mead was only on the field three or four minutes at the start, and he'd already got a score and made a couple of big runs and got a couple of big blocks. Declan Dalton, who's more of a, he's more of an enforcer, I would say, at the edge of the square now, a full forward. He, he got a goal and a point, but he also got in some huge hits, held the ball up. I think they need more of that kind, more of that kind of play, uh, maybe less of the silk and maybe more of the substance. And I think they have a better blend now. Dublin didn't offer much didn't offer much resistance to them now in fairness. Cork imposed themselves on the game and were able to kind of have their way with Dublin. Uh, it's a totally different prospect at the weekend. Um, and you don't know what you're going to get from Cork. You know, last year they were hammered by Tipperary in the first round. They come out and beat the All-Ireland champions convincingly uh, in the Gaelic rounds. And they got a reaction. And then, you know, a really, really poor performance against Clare and an awful second half against Kilkenny. So I be definitely doubting Thomas when it comes to Cork. I'm gonna to have to see a couple of games back to back before before I can uh, before I can believe them in them really. And then on Tipperary, Liam Sheedy's two All Ireland wins with Tipperary. In twenty ten they came through the back door, having been bet ten points by Cork. And in 2019, they came through the back door having been beaten 12 points by Limerick. So nobody knows the back roads better than Liam Sheedy. And they've had two weeks now. The Bonner Matter had an injury and Seamus Kendi had an injury. They both missed out the last day. They're both brought probably back in contention now. So I'm expecting a, re a reaction from Tip. I, I, think, I think Cork will be much better than they were, obviously, against Waterford. And it'll be something similar as they were against uh, Dublin. But I'm just expecting a big, big reaction from Tip. Tip are the forgotten team. And I think last year's All-Ireland win. And fair enough, I, I, was, I was one of the, the ones to say that I thought the best team didn't win the All-Ireland last year. And I'll stand over that because I still think Limerick were the best team last year. But Tip have loads to prove. They won All-Ireland last year. Probably, probably not getting as much credit for it as they should. And they've been beaten in the first round by Limerick again. They have too many good players not to bounce back, to be honest with you. And I'm expecting a couple of new faces in. Dan McCormack's hardly a new face, but I'd expect him to start and expect a lot more physicality from Tipperary than we got the last day. And just a quick one as well. Um, obviously, Owen's heartbroken over the, the Kerry footballers being out, but the Kerry hurlers are still flying high. Who would have ever thought that the Kerry hurlers would be in the championship longer than the Kerry footballers? Mm. And they have, a ch they, have a chance to, um, they have a chance to put one foot in the Joe McDonough final when they play Antrim on uh, on Saturday, they'll actually go into it. It's probably gone flown under the radar, but Kerry will play in Leinster next year if they win the Joe McDonough. So because of the 
lack of a round robin series in Munster or Leinster this year. They can't play the bottom team in Munster if they do win the Joe McDonough. So they go straight into the Leinster Championship next year. Leinster Championship has six teams and they have to they have to beat Antrim at the weekend. They're making a thousand kilometer round trip up to Corrigan Park up in Belfast. So uh, on, I'm sure you and your Kerry brethren will be keeping fingers and toes crossed for the Kerry hurlers. And you're going to have to follow someone over the next couple of weeks. Absolutely, I, like the hockey West me a couple of weeks ago it was a brilliant result. I didn't realise that about the Leinster Championship though, because that was always the caveat, you know, that they would win the Joe McDonough Cup eventually, but they would have to play the bottom team in Munster because obviously they made that tweak with the new format. So it's just this year they have to win it this year if they want to get into the Leinster Championship. Whereas for 2022, it'll be into the Munster Round Robin uh, or a playoff for that if they win the Joe McDonough next year instead. Uh- yeah, it would get very messy if they if they won the Joe McDonough this year to be in Leinster, obviously, yeah. and they, there's obviously then there's no chance of getting into the Munster Championship until they were to get relegated from Leinster. But the winners of the Joe McDonough this year, regardless of who it is, even if it, if it's Antrim, they will be in the Leinster Championship next year. Of course, right. Kerry playing in Leinster is probably not anything wouldn't be anything that new because they played in the round robin stages or the the group stages in 2016 and 2017. But I just thought that was an interesting one, and they're making a thousand kilometer round trip up to up to Belfast, which is a, a fairly whopping journey too. Yeah, uh, Fortress Corrigan Park. All the Kerry hurlers want is parity of esteem, so it's appropriate that they're going to <laughs> Belfast at the weekend. One last question, Eddie Brennan. Poor Eddie Brennan is uh, trending on Twitter this morning. Is he going to be able to ride this out and be the leash manager next year because he's done a fantastic job with the leash hurlers and certainly his credentials have been um, enhanced by his work there. So it'd be a shame for that relationship to go south. Yeah, he's done a brilliant job. Um, And the one thing I will say about it is I don't think anybody could question his passion for leash hurling and his passion for progress. And in fairness, after the game on Saturday, he kind of said, you know, that he was, they were looking, he was wondering about more funding and looking for some ways of getting leash on parity. That's a man who wants to get leash to the next level and has already brought them up massive strides. They could have beaten, could have taken a big scalp on Saturday, beaten Clare. Obviously took a big scalp last year in Dublin. Um, no more than that, no more than anything, they, someone else will be the someone else will be the story later on today or someone else will be the story the day after. So from a leash point of view, I think they'd be very, very foolish uh, not to try and get him back. I know he was kind of 50-50 even before the last couple of days after the game on Saturday, but I think they'd be foolish not to hold on to him. He's he's, you know, introduced an awful lot of new faces and managed to keep them really, really competitive. And as I said, with a big championship win last year. Like if you look at if you're looking back at the history of Leash Hurling in a hundred years, they'll probably still be talking about that win over Dublin in O'More Park. So I think they'd be very, very foolish uh, not to do everything they can to hold on to him. Yeah, and I'd say loads of counties would like that passion uh, as the leader of their hurling um, setup and team and just to set the agenda for them. So if not least, then I've, I've no doubt somewhere else as well. Good stuff, Michael. Thanks a million. Enjoy the weekend. Cheers, man. Thanks a million. This might be the greatest weekend of hurling of all time. I'm, I'm not sure. There's, like I can't remember everything being uh. as good as this. <laughs> I would still, I would still take uh, semi-finals weekend with a uh, full crowd, but I see what you're saying, fixtures-wise and all that. It's rare that you would actually have four amazing fixtures on at once. But I, I, I actually think that semi-finals weekend in the hurling is the best weekend in the Irish sporting calendar at the moment. Never yeah, mind anything else. But this, this might actually trump it. Look at the fixtures, like yeah, Cork and Kerry straight knockout, Davy versus uh, Lowen straight knockout. So much riding on the line, and then. The greatest team, perhaps, um, Kieran Carey saying that they could go on and be the dubs in uh, in the former Limericks. I think there's plenty there. Right. OK. The 2020 All-Ireland Football Ta- Senior Championships are underway with a bang. They exploded last weekend to celebrate Super Value as part of their Support Where You're From campaign. have given us some great prizes to give away. We want you to dig out your favourite ticket stub or match programme, an old jersey, a photo with your hero, any GA-related items that you've been dying to tell the country about. Make a 20 second video explaining its significance. Get them into us on any OTB social channel or on WhatsApp 0879 180 180. We'll choose a winner every Friday during the championship. Each weekly winner lands a 200 euro voucher for Super Value near you and also the chance to star in Super Value's Super Fans series. A fly on the wall peek inside the homes of dedicated supporters around the country. Super Value proud sponsors of the GA Football All-Ireland Senior Championships. Check out facebook.com forward slash Super Value Ireland for more details and there's another Super Value Roadshow coming your way from OTB very soon. We're going to be back after this quick break. OTB AM. This 
is OTB Sports Radio. Here on OTB, the big names keep on coming as part of our Cadbury FC series of remote roadshows. Episode 5 is going to be an epic, and it's coming your way from Sunday the 15th of November. It's Nathan in conversation with Jason McAteer and Kenny Dalgleish. Stay tuned to OTB social channels and OTB Sports Radio for more details, and check out CadburyFC.com for updates on promotions and giveaways. Bet smart this season with Stat Betting on the Boyle Sports app. Bet on shots, shots on target, tackles, passes, assists, and more, all powered by Opta. Plus, put your feet up and cheer your bets home with free live streaming on every UK and Irish horse race. Why not check out the hottest action on the biggest sporting events right now on the Boyle Sports app? Boyle Sports. This is betting. Need help? Contact gamblingcare.ie. 18 plus. OTB. AM with Gillette, proud supporters of Movember. Gentlemen, let's move. Okay, if you want to get in touch this morning, 087 9180 180 is the number. OTBAM is live in association with Gillette. Good morning, start with Gillette, giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. Uh, we would love to hear from you this morning. Remember, you can leave a comment on the YouTube channel or, of course, you can always uh, get us at off the ball or at off the ball am on Twitter as well. What are we at? Uh, Ten minutes past nine here this morning. Uh, right, let's move on. So uh, one of our best and most successful sports people is a former soccer player, former basketball, both internationals, and former Dublin Gaelic footballer. It's Lindsay Pete. So here's a chat that she had with Owen about many of those items and uh, some of the big stories uh, in those sports at the moment. Have a look. OTB. AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. Okay, so Bank of Ireland are proud sponsors of Connacht, Leinster, Munster and Ulster Rugby. Competition's a good thing on and off the pitch. And that's why Bank of Ireland are celebrating those who never stop competing for their club and for their community. And one of Ireland's great competitors, Lindsay Peat, is with us now. Lindsay, how are you getting on? I'm great, Al. Thanks very much. Uh, let's actually start with that line of never stop competing. I know this is a, a fairly broad question, but to you, what makes a great competitor? Um, they never give up. You know, I think I love this campaign and, and to be involved in this campaign because, you know, anyone who's close to me and knows me, probably I don't have the same personality and competitive nature when I'm off a pitch or a court and uh, that competitor and that I suppose inner warrior was able to help me overcome that and that's probably um the theme of this that it's so relatable to to anybody even outside of sport that you just have to you know you know channel that inner competitor to try and push yourself over the barriers that you might face uh, whether that's in work in your personal life or uh, for me in a, in a sport capacity as well to to because i suppose even through my own career there's been barriers there's been you know, self-doubt, there's been imposter syndrome, there's been questions that asked me and every time I was able to keep reassuring myself and using that competitor and that competitive nature to not let uh, let those, I suppose, negatives overcome and I was able to play on through it. So uh, for anybody, you know, to never stop competing is to never let the, the negatives uh, stand in your way and, and halt your progress through life or achieving what you want to, to achieve through your own life. When did the imposter syndrome crop up at its worst? Probably when I started rugby, to be honest. Um, uh, a little bit when I started with Dublin, I remember Jerry McGill kept trying to ring me. Um, and I just wouldn't answer his calls. because so I was like, I don't know what this chap sees in me that I can bring to, to an inter-county team. And I knew a lot of the girls from playing them through club, but I'd see them obviously and support them. And, and I just felt that I couldn't match them on any level. So I couldn't see in, in myself what he thought I could bring to this team. And eventually he just kept bringing on. I gave in and I was like, right, that's, I'm just going to have to put myself out there to prove to him, which wasn't, you know, I had to be very vulnerable to, you know, sort of, you know, basically setting myself up to fail to prove to this guy that you need to stop bringing me because I can't give you anything. And it probably came on the back of having a, a rocky start when John O'Leary was the manager and I was really raw and only really started uh, Gaelic football again after playing a bit in primary school. So um, I never really got over that part of it and felt really insecure and I was like, no, nah, I'm not putting myself back there. And lo and behold, then I get to play in my first year in a, in All-Ireland final and then ended up winning one in 2010 and continued on uh, in through 2014. And then it really cropped up again in in 
But I've about known the girls when I was in GAA and, and known people who had my back. Now I was in a totally different world with rugby. Like I'd only really had max eight games with club. If even I'd only started during the summer, I hadn't even played with Leinster at that stage. And I went straight to, to the international in the stoop um, against England of all teams, you know, and uh, I didn't even know some of the girls to say hello to, you know, I'd never seen them before. And now I'm, I'm in this jersey and I felt so insecure and I was like, I'm so embarrassed to even be here among these very talented people. And again, you didn't want to let them down. You didn't want to let anybody down. So yeah, it was, you know, imposter syndrome has come up a, a lot of the time and it, and it still will crop its head up to, because you're looking at yourself asking, are you going to meet these expectations that your teammates or your, the coaching staff or like, like Leinster, you know, even when I started there or, we went to Twickenham last year when I was, you know, Ben gave me the nod of being co-captain along with Michelle Claffey and, and uh, you know, alongside our captain, Senna Niapu as well. Um, you're like, oh God, how can I even be in the shoes of these great players beside me and try and, lead, you know, lead by example with a team of players who some of which are more skillful than me and could offer a little bit more. So you're always questioning yourself because you never want to let anybody down. So um, you just try and not overthink, reassure yourself and, Keep telling yourself, well, they see something in me that I can obviously bring to this team and just be yourself. You know, I can only be myself. They've seen something in me. Even if I don't see it, you know, just do what you do. So you were feeling a little bit of the imposter syndrome as recently as last year? Yeah, at times they'll come up, you know, especially now rugby has such a deeper pool of players. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? You're like, oh God, you know, I'm coming. I suppose now I'm coming, I'm older, I'm like, all right, I'm the older athlete, yeah, I'm historically, you know, have a long career now, 25 years, but I'm sure I'm thinking, right, younger players, like, who the hell does this one, you know, think she is, what <laughs> she bring, you know, I'm thinking, right, they're fitter, they're more athletic looking, they're younger, um, they can adapt quicker in S&C, but, you know, even last year, Christmas, we had a bit of a competition, you know, in-house, um, so we had a table, and I ended up finished top of that, and I won a mug with my picture on it. And it means the world because you're like, <laughs> you're not only competing with yourself, you're, if there's any questions there that haven't been actually asked to your face, you know, you are really answering them. And if it's not, you're not really answering them for everyone else, but you're answering them internally. If you're sort of saying, no, what do they see in me? Do they think I'm too old? I think I'm not able. And even on a culture level, what do they see in me? Are they questioning me? And there's little moments in your career where you're like, you take the opportunity to reassure yourself and then, you know, the knock on effect of that is that you hope that you've reassured everyone else uh, around you that you're still um, a quality member of this squad and you can off- offer an awful lot. When we went to Twickenham last year, I had missed the Autumn Internationals with a neck injury. I hadn't trained since we won the um, Interpros, you know, five games on the trot. So yeah, I thought, you know, I'm out of action. I'm, I'm older now. Am I going to come back sharp? Uh, then Ben played me at six and it's probably one of my best games of rugby I've played in Twickenham. So um, it was a huge boost of confidence for me. It was one of my best games. It was, it was in a Leinster jersey. And it was also, I don't think people realise what progress Leinster have helped us make in the last two years by their mm. support. And obviously the knock-on effect of that is having the support of Bank of Ireland with, um, through all four provinces, but especially with obviously Leinster rugby and then the knock-on effect of how Leinster rugby have supported us and making that game a reality. Like I'd only played in Twickenham once before with an Irish team. Um, some players may never get to play there. Uh, the stadium itself is, is like Crow Park. It's a, it's a chasm. It's, it's, it's fantastic. Uh, so to make that game against Harlequin has happened um, to have a, te- you know, on YouTube and to be professional and see exactly like the lads do. Some players have never experienced that. Um, so a huge thank you to Leinster and to Bank of Ireland because without their support, we can't continue to progress. You know, we can't continue to progress individually and collectively. And um, so, yeah, that that's probably one of the pinnacles of my career and, and one of my most enjoyable games uh, in rugby and in a Leinster jersey. What you've been saying there, I think it really underlines just how important internal competition is as much as the, comp- the competition against your opposite number on a big match day in the Six Nations or whatever it may be. How much yeah. do you often have to, I guess, hype that up a little bit or even make it a little bit bigger in your head than sometimes it really is to get the most out of you? And I'm just talking about you personally. I'm sure everybody has their own little psychological ways of getting the best out of themselves. Oh, listen, I look at uh, the qualities of, of 
say whoever's going against you know loose head but I don't even look at a I don't want to when we get our program out say for a front row I don't want to be the best front row I want to compete with the back rows you know that's what I do mm. you're always trying to bring the bar up so much and um you don't want to be just safe like I don't think for me and it's hard because you're coming out of your comfort zone to really test yourself and you're really setting yourself up to fail and it's happened and until you fail really you don't know what it takes to really succeed and I know that's confusing possibly or a cliche but you have to feel the emotion of failing in order to really reap the rewards of the emotion of succeeding um and as I said like even building up to the 2017 World Cup and ever since that I don't want to as I said just be a comfortable within the you know margins that they've given us for whatever a international back row sh- or front row should be I want to be trying to um, emulate whatever the international back rows are to be, always be ahead of the game um, so you'll always be looking at what the what it takes on a just basic level to be able to compete and then you want to surpass that and you always want to try because if you're safe you don't bring out the internal competitor how could it come out because you're not really competing anything. you're just safe you're really nice and comfortable and someone's giving you up the walk but you really want to push out the boundaries push out the standards and that only not only has not gone effect on you but as a collective and you would hope that that would motivate not only yourself but others to raise their bar as well and then as I said you're now not just all simmering in a, in a safe zone you're now outside your comfort zone really starting to push the boundaries and improve um I said I don't want to just truck the ball up and, and get gain line carries yes but I want to be out in the loose as well trying to do a loop, run an A box, run a flat line, you know, be out on the wing trying to, you know, mismatch a winger. You want to put yourselves in that position. Not silly, you have to do your job as well, but you always want to be, um, you don't want to be pigeonholed. You want mm. to always be trying to be better. And as I said, I've been able to do that through sport, not necessarily always through my life in work, or um, I'd be very probably insecure. And I never put myself outside that. And it's only now in later life, um, as I suppose, looking at the end of my career, um, trying to get ready for maybe you know post you know retirement to make sure that I have those tools that I can bring into my own life to remind me to never stop competing because I think that's when you know I really feel that uh that warrior has maybe left me or you know so I have to you always have to channel that so as much as you know I'm part of the the campaign on a sporting level I've been able to bring it into my personal life as well because they have provided barriers and it's been sport and the internal competition that reminds me to just keep on going and and not let those barriers stand in my way. And has that worked? Has the psychological lessons you've learned from sport helped you on a professional, on a personal level? Absolutely. Um, it's hard. Sometimes your back's against the wall and, and no more than in sport, I have to remember what did I do? You know, what did I do when Jeremy Gill kept uh, ringing me? What did I do when I was in the stoop and I'm in the background? I haven't got one clue of what, you know, the rules of rugby are or the laws of rugby are, you know, and I have to reassure myself that I'm here for something and I can only control the controllables. I can only be myself that someone has got me here um, or if I'm in an interview for work that I display all the good qualities and make sure I can um, action them in an interview to prove that I'm worth taking the chance on and that I, you know, I'll work hard and I'll, I'll push myself and I'll, better myself to make sure I'm the best version of myself to to add to this company or this team or um especially add to myself you know that's the big thing with this never stop competing that you have to put yourself outside of your comfort zone to better yourself you know and to remind yourself that you're more than capable of taking on these challenges um so it's hard as I said it's, it's really hard um I've had to remind myself I've had to take a deep breath and sometimes say right this interview for now isn't meant for me uh, what can I do if I do fail? Get feedback, be vulnerable, uh, look at the qualities that I might need to improve on and how am I going to improve on them? So, as I said, it's an old head now that's gone through a lot of um, times where, you know, I have had setbacks, I have had failure, and I've had to be vulnerable. I've had to look in the mirror, I've had to look at myself and strip myself back and then try and build myself up to be a better version of myself. It sounds like you're speaking so well about how ready you are for a post playing life. Do you ever feel that? Sometimes people are pushing you in that direction, saying, right, time is getting on now at this point. It's, uh, it's only a matter of time before you'll be focusing on things uh, that won't involve talking out for Ireland, for example. Do you, do you feel that pressure at all? Um, a little bit. Right. But like last week when we played Italy, um, 
what a way to prove, you know, age is only a number. Mm. You know, I turn 40 tomorrow. Um, oh, happy early birthday. I probably, thank you very much. Uh, I probably, in my own head, didn't want to be ever playing on an international pitch at 40 because I think it's an embarrassment. And then I have to remember to myself, well, you know, there's world records to be maybe looked at. And, you know, can I surpass what other people have done and, and be um, a 40 year old who's played in a World Cup qualifier or, you know, maybe make a World Cup at that age or, you know, I can put the limitations on myself if I want. And I, it has been my own insecurity about my age and, and not having a place in a very young team. I think I'm only one of three or four when we put down our dates of birth are, are born in the 80s. You know, all the rest are actually know 90s and 2000s so why do you um, why do you feel embarrassed about that uh, like is that not as I, I would have thought it would be a source of huge pride it's, it's interesting that you use the word uh, embarrassed about that I was initially I suppose because I feel maybe it's a it's a you know a young athlete's world and and I don't again it, it brings you back to that do what what can I offer at this age you know am I injury prone am I going to be slow am I going to be you know long to recover and anything and to be honest last week against Italy I you know I broke my leg against England I never thought I'd come back from that injury and play international rugby again um and all of the feedback that I got was you know so you know the fitness levels of the team and especially as I said at, at 39 and I think uh, if I'm not mistaken I'm the oldest person to have scored in a Six Nations so I now hold I think a new a new title <laughs> you know so it's those reminders. It's it's the reminders of those, you know, overcoming those challenges where you remind yourself, oh, I have to say to myself, Lindsay, no, never stop competing. Don't stop competing because you still have so much more to give. And until there's a time where really you feel you've you've done enough or you don't want to give it anymore, then it's on your terms. Um, so I said the the try last week and the assist with Claire Malloy and mm. a really good team try, I was a huge part of that. I really enjoyed it. Um it, it does take me a little bit longer to recover than some of the others, but I also am very mindful of what I need to, to make sure I'm ready to go again. Um, so no, the embarrassment initially is, is yeah, it is one of a huge wide right, but again, it comes back to the comp the campaign and, and where we probably throw our insecurity and our perceptions of what other people might think on ourselves. And that's what probably a lot of the time with the embarrassment saying, oh God, imagine what people think of a 40-year-old. Whereas, Mm. It is a reminder that I still have lots to give. I still get huge in, enjoyment for competing. And, and as I said, that competitor coming out and always wanting to be better. And until that goes, really, um, I still have a huge place and a lot to give in, in the sporting world, I would hope. And um, yeah, I, I do have a sense of huge pride. And I just have to, uh, as I said, when, I, when the competitiveness, if someone else questioned me to my face, I know the competitive come out and all I want to do is prove them wrong. So yeah. that's where the never stop competing comes out, that that inner competitive warrior comes out and says, no, I'll prove you wrong. And that's what has thankfully helped me over my 25 years through four different sports, through probably a lot of people having questions or a lot of time I have to prove myself, you know, it, it has come back to, you know, I'll prove you wrong. And, and that, you know, competitive nature coming in and, and making sure that I didn't let any, anything stop me. You mentioned playing in the front row. You mentioned playing in the back row. Does the assist against Italy not mean you're a wing candidate immediately? Listen, you and me on are the same opinion. I think that's my <laughs> next centre. Maybe I'll work my way out, you know, back row to the centre to wing. So uh, that's the hope. That's, listen, as I said, I never stop uh, trying to beat the, you know, the the boundaries or the barriers that are put up. So you never know. I might uh, be out in the wings. Soon. <laughs> Uh, can, can we talk about that injury? Because you mentioned the, the, the horrible injury at the start of the year. Uh, what exactly happened? What was the prognosis? And how touch and go would it be for you back then to have actually played a game this year? Um, so I broke the leg, the fibula against uh, England. I went in for surgery. So that was on the Sunday. And I went in for surgery with Johnny McKenna on the Monday in, in Santry. Got a plate in and I got a tight rope for my syndesmosis ligament. So all was good, but like anything, when you go under surgery and, and you get it in, it's, it's how the body recovers. COVID was a blessing in the sense that, you know, ironically, I told um, Adam Briggs in a text that I'd be ready to go for Italy. And he was like, yeah, you just recover and get yourself back on your feet. And what did I do? But thankfully got to play against Italy last week. So COVID was a blessing in the sense that, you know, the matches were off and I didn't miss any. However, then I didn't have any access to any hands-on physio, any soft tissue. Um, I did get equipment from the RFU 
So thankfully I was able to continue in that sense with my rehab. Um, but when you've no physio directing, directing that rehab, I had a bit of a setback probably halfway through. So um, actually up until camps went back for us um, with Ireland, it was probably touch and go whether I was able to, t- the leg wasn't taking the load, so it kept swelling on me. Uh, so anytime I had any long distance runs, it uh, just wasn't controlling the swelling and that was a huge issue I had post-surgery. Um, so as much as lockdown was a blessing, and I, we had a four-year-old that we had to like keep running, you know, getting out and walking. So um, it was very hard to stay still and, and try and manage that swelling. So yeah, we just turned a corner. Thankfully, at one stage, got a bit of needle and finally when lockdown was over, um, tried to release a couple of stuff, got some hands-on tissue work, um, lots of work with John Montgomery, the, the physio with the RFU and thankfully we turned a corner but as I said with any big injury like that with a break you just never know how the body's going to react thankfully I that was my only major injury other than a bulging disc in the neck you know I haven't broken any bones to touch wood right. hopefully there'll be no more but um, and yeah age comes into that as well with just how, how the body will recover so it was touch and go for a long time I didn't know whether I'd get back on a pitch but um, thankfully I'm here with positive news how big is that worry then before you turn that corner before the needling starts the, like and and i guess as you say you had a few setbacks do you start to get a little bit existential about your rugby career during those worrying days yeah because um i'll always have that what sport has brought me um you know through the philosophy of never stop competing how it, where it's gotten me the place i've got to see the players i've got to play with the um the awards, the jerseys I've got to wear, like that, that, that resonates. You know, the message through this campaign resonates through my life story, thankfully, and it, and it really has a, an emotional connection with that because that that's gotten me to where it is. But to for the thought of taking sport away, and having that resilience, um, probably taken away from me, and having to readjust how I, um, approach things in life and and how they'll affect me was was tough, um. And I was trying to think to myself, my God. And, you know, during lockdown, I was able to nearly change how I trained, but I knew everyone else was in the same boat. But if mm-hmm. the fact the girls got on the pitch before I did, I think, you know, anyone who knows rehab, it's, it's a dark place and you really question yourself. You're on your own. You don't have that support network. And that really where um, the competitive streak, you need to find ways to get it, you know, to get it going again. So even like I had my son on my back trying to do press ups or I had a, you know, I was trying to think of ways where, right. Okay. The leg's not working, but can I get, you know, can I really increase my gun game? Could I, you know, reduce my body fat? And what can I work on, on the controllables that will get me through this lockdown and that when I do get back on this pitch, um, you know, we're just searching every Avenue to make sure I got back on it really. But there was, I can't lie and say there wasn't a, a, a period of, a, where I was really, really down really didn't think I'd get back in a jersey and it certainly wouldn't want to be the way I end my career um in international rugby but at the same time unfortunately you just don't always have control about how things will end for you so um just try to stay positive as I said it was little competitions thankfully the team as well we'd have a hit session every week and we'd again try bring in that bit of competition to get everyone motivated and um as I said just try different ways to get that competitive route so I wouldn't wouldn't stop, wouldn't lose motivation, wouldn't go to that dark place that it let me, you know, life pass me by. And that if I did get back then, I'd be way behind. So, um, yeah, thankfully, as I said, the inner competitor, with, you know, the bit of competition kept me motivated. And I said, it can be something simple like, you know, doing chin-ups off my side gate, um, you know, having my son sit on my back and try and do as many press-ups as I could, um, you know, squatting with him, wall walks out the back, loads of things. I'm sure if the neighbours looked into the back, they were thinking I was cracked. But um, <laughs> it's those little little snippets that you remind yourself when you've been here before. Like, what can you look back on your sporting career and use the, the different areas of happiness that you would have brought that competition through and and, in, and just engage in them and get yourself through it? Um, mm. And I said, thankfully, now we're the other side. But it is that competition that just pushes you to, to never stop competing with yourself. Does that help with the imposter syndrome aspect that we spoke about at the top here then? The fact that you've managed to get through this massive hurdle late in your career. Like, I mean, <laughs> there's been a, a, a whole host of incredible achievements, but that is just another in a, in a long list that surely adds to the confidence, adds to the fact that, no, I definitely belong to, I definitely belong where I am and I deserve to be where I am. 
yes it does but like as I said I'm sure everyone in life I'm sure maybe talking to you you can look at life everyone will possibly um connect with the imposter syndrome whether they're going for a job they feel they're not you know um fully qualified for or that they can't do like or do people really um know who I am or um do they trust I fully am who I am and it takes a long time to to get there and as I said it's your own insecurities that you're um projecting on other people even though that they might not even think that so um yeah it's little milestones especially as I said for me I suppose getting older and as the pool of players deepens there's there's more competition and and there's times where I'm like oh god I'm not a rugby player you know or I'm so much you know especially now like your players coming in if you look at the likes of Anya Breen and Avon Parsons who are probably playing rugby from a young age so their skill set is a lot more it's, it's so so much deeper than mine um so I'm still obviously having to um reignite and sharpen those uh, skill levels when I come back in whereas they're a lot more natural with them so it's even that that kind of question like am I am I mentally here do I have to work harder but it's I said the little motivations and the little um personal competitions with yourself to remind yourself that no I'm here like I am who I am um and if it wasn't for these qualities that you can still bring to this team you wouldn't still be here Mm. And the fact that I will drive myself to be the best version of myself. And as I said, it takes a long time um, to strip yourself back. Um, you, It'll be an overriding feeling of imposter syndrome. But if you're honest with yourself and you strip yourself back and you're vulnerable and you look at what probably qualities you have to remind yourself, yeah, they're good. You know, the, the team need them. But what are the, the skill levels or the parts of my personality and my game that I need to increase? So that's where I need to be vulnerable and ask for help. So that's where I go to coaches or I might go to Sene or I might go to um, some of my teammates and say, look, oh, geez, you're, you're a great scrimmager. Your rugby IQ is great. What can I improve here and bring clips? Um, and a lot of us are like, no, no, I can't, you know, I wouldn't do that. You know, I am doing well here and look at my carries and yeah, right. Grand, you might have had 11 carries and they're 11 gain line carries. That's great. But you, you have three missed tackles. You know, you haven't come off the line. With, you've, you've left a dog leg. You've, uh, you had three penalties in the scrum, you know, so I have to come my hand go, yeah, so how do I increase them? What can I do to improve myself? And it's it's those balance of reassuring yourself that you're meant to be here, but it's also um, always trying to to better yourself. And, and as I said, it is that competitor to come out and go, I want to prove you wrong. I am really bad at tackling at the minute, but I'm going to prove you wrong that I can tackle and I'm going to have no mm-hmm. missed tackles the next game. So it's little goals, little targets. Um, trying to improve yourself, um, and I said it's a tough, it's a tough ask because you know we all have those insecurities where we don't want to be questioned or we don't want our um, this side of us that needs improvement to be to be pointed out. But you know, I'm I'm never going to be complete. The day I'm a complete rugby player is the day the day I retire because you always have to be improving for to to better that jersey and to to prove to everyone why you're you've been picked in the as the, the start and lose head prop. You know, you always have to prove some why. Um, so yeah, it's it's those little moments that you that I would probably step away and think I'd be in my own world, be very quiet and think to myself, and then make a plan as to how I can, you know, achieve and, and prove people wrong and I'm better myself. And yeah, it takes time. It's taken that time for me to, I suppose, have a method to. And it again, it comes back to, you know, with Dublin, what did I do? You know, my solo was terrible when I first arrived. So it was really speedy. I had a really good turn of pace. But I couldn't get away from the fenders because my solo was so high that I was really easy to tap him. <laughs> you know, that way. Right. So then I used to just run up and down the pitch at full speed, trying to really bring my solo down. And I told the right foot and I told the left foot. Because again, if I was only right footed. Um, defenders would be able to to just put me on my left foot because they'd know I would have no ability to to solo. So how can I be the best version? Well, I you know, bring my solo down, I and I use both feet, and then I start kicking off both feet. Um, so now they know, they don't know which side I'm going to use. So the same with rugby, you know, are they going to expect this loose head prop is just going to, you know, head down, you know, try and go through a brick wall, or are they used to a prop that could use footwork that might engage defence, might give a pop pass off, um, you know, is is out on the loose and might have a turn of speed, you know. So you're always trying to set come up with um. I suppose extend your armory that you have so much uh, to offer in combat. Yeah, it's re- really, really interesting stuff. And I guess everything you're saying there is evidence of an unbelievable mentality. But it also, I guess, shows the importance of 
good coaching to keep people in the game. I mean, uh, it's great that you were able to, I guess, self-learn a little bit or identify your own weaknesses. How many people have been lost to sport as a result of thinking they weren't good enough or having an even greater sense of an, of an imposter syndrome? And perhaps there wasn't the resources, or there wasn't the coaches to actually pull somebody aside and say, actually, if you treat this little part of your game, you might actually be able to be better at this. And if you're better at it, you might actually hang around in the sport. I guess that's probably a, a whole other can of worms that I could open there and a conversation for another day. I did finally, I just want to ask you though, because uh, you have revealed that it is a uh, big 4 tomorrow. What is the plan? What is, uh, it's lockdown 2.0. How does uh, Lindsay Peet celebrate her, her 40th? Um, I think just, you know, you know, with my wife and son, just really just having family time and hopefully uh, back to Zoom now, you know, with my yeah. mom and dad and my sisters and my nephew. And um, I already, I have a present arrived here from a great friend who lives in Birmingham. So that's arrived. And I see the, the postman give a card before I get on to you. And um, so to be honest, just take stock of everything I've done, all the achievements um all the great you know people I have in my life um and as I said that comes through like I wouldn't be sitting here talking today if it wasn't just the great people in my life to support that includes coach and that includes club that it really has a big shout out to Leinster Rugby and to Bank of Ireland who are you supporters of, of rugby uh in Ireland and women's rugby and you know we didn't even get to touch on I suppose other barriers of you know being girls trying to fight for you know stand up and, and get people to take notice of us so uh, there's loads of things and yeah, as I said tomorrow will just be a celebration of, of life and being happy and healthy and uh, still being on a rugby pitch and, and involved in a very happy place that I am so um, that'll be that 100% and we must catch up again about and talk about all the things that you mentioned there just a reminder that Bank of Ireland are proud supporters of rugby in Ireland as sponsors of the four competing provinces of Connacht, Leinster, Munster and Ulster they are celebrating those who never stop competing on and off the pitch uh, Lindsay, it's great to see you back out on the pitch. Congratulations on your comeback and enjoy the birthday tomorrow. Thanks a million. OTB AM. Great stuff there from Lindsay Pete. Always a fascinating interview. And that is almost our lot from OTB AM this morning. I just want to remind you about our Cadbury FC series of remote roadshows now. So we've had a couple of in-depth charts so far with the likes of Gary Neville, Teddy Sheringham, Packy Bonner, Shea Given, Sol Campbell, Ian Wright, Glenn Hoddle, and Harry Redknapp, it has been quite a list so far. And next up, we have Jason McAteer and Kenny Dagleish, and that's coming your way from Sunday the 15th of November. Stay tuned to OTB Sports social channels for more details, and go to otbsports.com to check out those previous remote roadshows. It is all with thanks to Cadbury FC. Check out cadburyfc.com for updates on promotions and giveaways. Now, coming up on OTB Sports Radio today, we have OTB Gold from 1 o'clock, which is on the life and times of the boxer Johnny Kilban. At three o'clock then, Dadcast is live. And from four, we revisit one of our Mount Rushmore conversations. Tyrone is on the agenda at four. At five o'clock then, we are live with the ball game. And at 6 p.m., it is OTB Gold in the company of Barry Ryan, author of the brilliant cycling book, The Ascent. Off the Ball, as ever, is live on air and online from seven o'clock tonight. OTB AM, back with you tomorrow from half past seven in the morning. And you can listen on the OTB Sports app or subscribe to the OTB AM podcast wherever you get your pods. We'll chat to you tomorrow morning. Bye-bye for now. Brilliant. Yeah. What a great game. 2012. Um, 2012, the last time Cork beat Kerry in the Championship. Yeah, it's, it's, that's obviously um, number one sport in, in Cork, obviously, hurling of football. So, um, geez, that's a long time, a long, long time. But hopefully for that team now and for that group, it's a big monkey off their back and um, they can kick on, you know? few things to talk to you about. Let's start with La Rochelle because things are going very well. So uh, sixth game out of seven, one uh, against uh, Claremont over the weekend, 19 points to 10. Claremont go to second. La Rochelle top of the top 14, seven games in. Is this the first time you've been top? Uh, yeah. That must, feel yeah. that must feel nice. Do you give yourself yeah, you a satisfied cup of tea and a bar of chocolate when you get home? <laughs> <laughs> You know me well from from off air, don't you? Uh, yes. Um, what did I have? Uh, I had a good cup of tea, yeah, and a whisper. Yeah, it was great. A uh, good day. Um, but yeah, things are going well, and it's important you acknowledge that too because we will hit rocky patches. That's no doubt uh, that'll happen in this marathon season of ours. But uh, as you say, six out of seven, it's, I suppose, the most pleasing part from, from the staff's point of view is that you're... Um, seen transfer from what you're doing during the week and you're putting it out on match night. So um, 
we seem to have a great habit of starting games really well, but then uh, really knocking off in second halves. But uh, it's good that we're able to put away teams in the first half, so we have plenty to work on. But at this stage, it's um, it's why you uh, you love the game that you're you're involved in, and things are going well. And what are the big things you're trying to do with La Rochelle? Oh, um, I suppose we're trying to create an identity. We're trying to understand who we are and what we stand for and how we want to play the game. Um, and I think you have to have a few game plans within the game plan, if you if if you, if you understand me. So depending mm -hmm. on conditions, depending on opposition, depending on, um, I suppose, the framework you give players, um, you're hoping they're able to pull the trigger on a few options when they go into the heat of battle. But... Uh, yeah, it's been really interesting, Joe. I suppose it reminds me of Monster maybe uh, 20 years ago with fantastic supporters. Um, but last night it was the first time ever playing um, in uh, wheat cloth, they call it over here. So there's no one in the ground. Mm. And um, oh, it must be really hard being a, being a player. Just very, there's obviously no emotional energy. In fact, that it's like a, a heated training session in that regard. So. In terms of feeding off stuff, it's going to be a challenge for all of us about how we're going to, I suppose, create the um, the process for the week and on game night especially. But that's that comes down to mindset too, which is a good challenge for us as a coaching group. And Ronan, when you talk there about game plans and then even options and other game plans within the game plan, of course you're going to you're going to fit a game plan to suit the players you have. But equally, I know you're you know you're a student of the game and you're watching other coaches and how they've gone about their business. Are there certain coaches that you find yourself borrowing from more than others? Who might they be? Oh, well, I would obviously, as you're well aware, the Crusaders have, has left a big impression on me, so I wouldn't be straying too far from that, but it would be wholly, I suppose, inaccurate to try and implement um, what they are doing, but a lot of my ideas would come from, from there. But I think the great thing about spending time with a lot of good players and a lot of good coaches is that it essentially comes back down to uh, doing the simple things well. That sounds like uh, the greatest probably uh, understatement of all time, but um, I, I genuinely believe that. And it it is uh, with the ball, it's all about, I suppose, your carry intent and seeing can you see space. And without the ball, it's basically how much pressure you can put on the opposition. My sense of uh, building an identity is that at Munster in your playing days, that was almost, you know, uh, obvious to everybody. You were so many locals and, and a bit of sprinkling of stardust and the identity was probably fairly obvious to you, whether you were conscious or not of it as, as a group of players. Um, it strikes me from afar, top 14, teams like La Rochelle, there is more of a mercenary aspect to it, more of a, mercenary is unfair, yeah. more, more of a professional you know, I don't know how many players yeah. are from La Rochelle. So in terms of creating an identity that's really going to work for the players the way Munster worked for ye, do you hand that over to them and get them to break off into little groups and come up with stuff? Or do you set it out for them and, and try and sell it to them? Uh, no, I think the, the vision would, would, would be my responsibility. I, right. think, I think my job isn't to motivate players, it's to inspire players. And that was something that Razor was excellent at. And... Um, I think uh, that's exactly why you're involved in the sport is that you try to give these young kids and, and older experienced players, uh, we're trying to create an environment in La Rochelle which would be the best in Europe for them, so on and off the pitch, but we're way off that at the minute, but there's no harm having that goal and and trying to make it as as enjoyable as possible for them. So, uh, you know, you have to get the environment first, I think right first if you want to transfer it to the pitch and we have to get a tight group and there's an awful lot of games in France, obviously, and it's a it's a dog of a competition. It's extremely difficult to top 14 because there's so much history and pride involved in the competition that you don't ever get a chance really to breathe because I think we're in, we'll be going 18 Saturday, well, 18 weekends in a row of a game so that you, you need to use your squad and you need to use it wisely. But at the minute, there's a great buzzer out the, about the place and that makes, I suppose gives you satisfaction that you are taking these this club and these boys in the right direction but it's 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 in its infancy but um it's very important too that you that you um you dream you dream big we had you on with brian o'driscoll sometime during lockdown it's hard to know what month at this stage that 
time was uh, yeah, strange. Exactly. strange. It's but still all lockdown. Yeah, Months well, don't matter. It's a bit like that. It's great to have the sport back. But I remember you talking about, you know, you're, you're dealing with a squad and that very much includes those players who are not playing very often and aren't happy. Um, and you weren't sure how, well, how do you, you were almost musing out loud and chatting with Brian that day on the show. How do you deal with them? Do you put the arm around them? Do you ignore them? Do you cut them? Do you try and win them over? Have you fallen on an approach that works for you? Ah, uh, yeah, no, I think, well, obviously, if you, if you ignore them and you cut them, you, you, you're cutting yourself. So it would be a ludicrous thing to do. I think uh, before that, you probably have to look at your recruitment too and how you get that right and how important it is because the club game is very different to the international game where you have a budget and you have X amount to spend and you, and you need to spend it wisely. But um, I think it's very important that you set out your your principles at the start of the season about... You mean you can't say that you genuinely need everyone if you don't use them. So the proof is in, in your utilization of the squad so what happened brilliantly last weekend was the fact we went to Poe and I think we made six changes and, and we won the game but it didn't matter who was playing it what matters is who's in the jersey so that's kind of an ethos we're trying to create and um, and it is important because it's very hard to uh, to say to a player that uh, you know I mean I need you and depend you without actually playing them on the pitch they're not robots they have emotions and need to be they need to be uh, really cared about. And I think um, as long as you're honest and I think and as long as they understand what you're trying to achieve with the group, uh, hopefully there will be an understanding. They may, they may disagree and dislike it, but I think ultimately they will respect it. We're only seven games in. I'm sure you're as conscious of that as anybody. What are realistic expectations then season's end for La Rochelle? Ah, I, I wouldn't even think like that, Joe. It's, as you know, I'm ambitious and y you want to... Uh, you know what I mean? Try and win every competition you enter, obviously. Um, but, um, you know, I think the most important thing for, for us is that we continue to get better, and we have gotten better, but there's a lot of, I suppose, potential there to get better. But, um, you know, there's. If, I think it would be a serious mistake to look at next May uh, with COVID, with the with the potential or with the obvious changes in the, in the planning and the schedule daily, weekly, um, you, I suppose the, the new norm now is your your capability to adapt, and mm. we see the group seems to be adapting well. So, um, you know, it, it's it's uh, little mini blocks of games, but I think the most important thing is is our boys enjoying it. If boys enjoy it, it doesn't feel like work. Yeah, have you still been largely COVID free? Um, we have, yeah, we have players wise, a few of the administration staff and one or two sports sorry, uh, academy players have got it, have got it. Um, but uh, it's, uh, I suppose, the the protocol is rigorous. So, um, you know, you're, you're, you're very much, there's a responsibility to obviously not to mix with, with uh, people. It's very hard to control that, but I think a lot of people appreciate that we have momentum and we'd be a little bit of shooting ourselves in the foot if we were to... To bring the house down in terms of not 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 um, adhering to those um, guidelines we'd be given. Very good. Well, keep it going. We haven't talked to you since Stade de France, Ireland, uh, well beaten in the end. What did you make of the game? Um, it was cagey for a while. I felt, and then, um, you know, as probably as we as we spoke about, I think. Um, the form of Dupont and Vaktakawa, obviously, I think Entomac brought his game to a new level um, that night. And um, I thought it was a 28 13 with 30 minutes to go that France could win by 31 points. Um, which, you know, I mean, the French team, when they have their tails up, they, they can do that to teams. But credit to Ireland and credit to uh, Robbie Henshaw, a moment of individual brilliance brought by Ireland back into the game. And um, I, uh, I subsequently obviously read a lot of articles and, and listened to a few discussions that it was um, uh, a lot of errors caused by by our Ireland, I think, in terms of their execution. They were very disappointed. But um, I think France, France for me on the night, uh, were the better team and, and probably comfortably the better team. And what did you make of the Ireland performance? I thought it was mixed. I think there was... Um, some areas, I suppose, their capacity to, to get themselves back into the game. Um, um, I think 
one area that potentially um, they may may look at would be probably the ball carrying threats. It looked it looked as a uh, you know me watching it on the couch that it, I didn't really know in the blue jersey who was about to carry. It seemed that their deception around the carrier was a little bit more um, uh, varied than Ireland. I think it was or obviously Ireland have a big emphasis on 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 their ruthless about how they play. I suppose their their maps and their their strategy, but um, France looked looked more dangerous in broken play, and uh, maybe that's just down to individuals. But um, um, I think it was it was. Um, I mean, uh, this team, the Irish team, have got to a stage where they will be very disappointed with with uh, the way they not very disappointed, but disappointed with the way they played uh, inside the France because of the the. Um, the standards they've set for themselves, but then you also, I suppose, hear to what the players are saying and the staff are saying it's a different team than 2018 and a lot of guys have moved on and it's mm. a new era and, and and it is a new team, but, but I suppose um, where um, where France um, looked to, um, they just looked a little bit more dangerous with the ball is what I'm trying to say, Joe, yeah. sorry. No, 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 you've made perfect sense there. And like, it's what Ireland are aspiring to do under Mike Catt and Andy Farrell now. More deception, to be more dangerous in broken prey, you know, to get away from that predictable, yeah. predictable word that was thrown at them. Because if you take away, and I know it's a, it's a big enough if, but if you take away for a moment the Robbie Henshaw try and the Stockdale try, moments of individual brilliance, you know, um, and that's great, and you know, you'll always need that to win. But I'm kind of looking at the team wondering, well, you know what's what's the, the the kind of method as a team? How are they hurting the opposition? You know, routinely across the eighty minutes, and I don't know. Like Jesus, greater ruby minds than than me are saying they don't, they're not seeing much of a pattern there, or not seeing much to get too uh, excited about there. I, no, I just think you saw the difference between Italy and France in terms of. I thought we saw definite shape and promise against Italy. There's no doubt about that. We use every blade of grass in the Aviva, and we stretched them from. And, and and you say, well, that's easy against Italy, but it's very, very hard to do that against France. So you probably, hopefully, against Wales, you get to see the middle ground about where this team is. I think there's definite emphasis on keeping the ball alive in the tackle, playing it out of the tackle. I think there's uh, more of a focus on the offload, and uh, I think there's a left of a focus on, on, on Nine's kicking game. Uh, but, uh, but is it hurting the opposition is the question. Um... Like it all sounds great, it, it did, you know. It, it sounds great. Game. It didn't in that game because you know, f physically France have, have an awful lot of of big, powerful men that are in form, and they're they're like an example would be Greg Aldred, who's I think he's a three man of the matches in the Six Nations. They've Dupont, they've Entemac, um, and they've Vatikawa, and they've probably had um, you know they've a bundle of riches at at, at Hooker, and they've Bernard Leroux in the second row. They've a lot of. They have a lot of competitive players, but they have weaknesses too in their team. And it was probably, I suppose, a frustration of Andy Farrell's and the fact that he he felt that um, Ireland released uh, the pressure valve in France because they didn't put them through more phases and, and to tire them out as 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 much as they can. But yeah, uh, your point is valid in the fact that uh, it, the opposition didn't. It looked. Um, at times, and that happens when you don't win collisions, that um, Ireland's attack wasn't as sharp as the French attack. Mm. I'm almost reluctant to bring him up because I, I feel the fella has had more than enough scrutiny. But just give us a brief word on Jacob Stockdale. Um, it's it's uh, That's the difference between club rugby and international rugby and the fact that you have, a, I mean, a second less with every ball and... Um, the ball came. Uh, uh, you know, he made a f he he made a few errors. Um, an awful lot of players have, have make uh, make errors. It's and I suppose it's his capacity you now to to rebound. But it's probably not the first time he he's had errors. So uh, you know, I mean, what difference? Good good players and great players players they don't make the same errors two weeks in a row. I don't think he's made the same errors two weeks in a row. He's been, I suppose, criticised for. Um, some defensive lapses. Um, I think Jacob Scottdale is what twenty one, is he or twenty two? Is he twenty three at this stage? He's getting on. He's getting on twenty three. Okay. Uh, Touching twenty four. Like that was his thirtieth cap. You know, he's, he's he feels like yeah, a rookie, but he's, but he's, he's not a rookie. Yeah, he's playing international rugby probably three years. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 
But the way the game has changed now and with the way defences are aligned, the winger is nearly the most important guy in the defensive alignment. It was probably in previous years, it was 13. Before that, it was kind of an up and out defence. Now defenders, you have your playing your wingers high, so it means that they kind of sometimes have to hit fourth last attack or third last attack or second last. So the decision making involved is very difficult for them. So he has made errors on the wing, but he's young. But I don't think he's made the same errors. But what happened at the weekend is that he probably, um, uh, you know, high ball is probably an, a new aspect to him at 15 and and, and uh, pushing the ball through along the floor on a wet night and in Paris was new to him as well and he, and, and he, made, and he made errors. So, um, you know, it's very difficult to be able to play 15 on a level at test, at, at test uh, level. So I think for him, he needs to, um, if he gets the opportunity, he needs to, I think um, you you can say um, because I read his article, I thought it was very, it was it was a good mindset he had, and the fact that against New Zealand he, uh, Kieran Reid knocked on his chip, and remember I think that that was probably it would have been nearly game set and or not it would have been a huge turning point. Yeah. In the in New Zealand game. Uh, in the Aviva, but then consequently later in the game he did the same. Well, it wasn't the same chip, but he executed the same skill and a perfect rebound, and he scores and he wins the game for Ireland. Yeah. Um, so um, I'm, det I'm detecting I, I, you, you I, think it's too early to give up on this guy. There's too much talent there. Oh yeah, yeah. You can't do that. You can't give up on a guy. You 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 can potentially. There's absolutely uh, a few ways you can play it, but. Uh, he obviously needs an arm around him, but I think um, in the fact that, um, you mean it wouldn't be either way. You can leave him out against Wales, and it's not it's not the end of the road for for him by any means. There's sure. just there's a way of doing this, but it, it needs to be obviously. Uh, and Andy Farrell would have a great human side to him that um, he 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 probably needs to understand that making it an error at a club level is very different to making error at test level, especially if you're the last line of defence and um, ball and is very, very precious in the test game. Mm. So Wales come to town on Friday. This Autumn's Na Autumn Nations Cup is uh, starting. Uh, James Lowe is now available for selection. How big an impact can he have in a green jersey? How highly are we rating James Lowe? I mean, we see what he does at provincial level. You've talked, though, about the differences between provincial and international. Yeah. No, but he's playing with it. You know, what I mean, with Leinster, who are all firing. Um, there's no doubt about he can set the world alight with the ball. Um, but there would be question marks uh, about his uh, his game without the ball. And I think um, he's improved hugely under Stuart Lancaster when you when you watch Leinster. Um, but um, he's kind of seems to be the guy that plays with a smile on the face, and he tries. Um, I suppose the more pressurised the situation, he seems to enjoy it, and he seems to get his game to that to that level. There's a lot of X factor in in this guy, so it'll be uh, it'll be fascinating to watch if he, if, he, if he gets on the pitch. OTB AM with Gillette, proud supporters of Movember. Gentlemen, let's move.